virtuosity with you and thoughts. Just a second. That's better. Happy New Year. I know I'm a few days early, but this happens to be when I put out the weekly video. I start this video with a review with zero spoilers. Certainly, if I spoil anything, I will warn before I do so and like hold up an index finger until I'm done. So you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. But as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including for earlier entries in the franchise. Sorry? I am not 100%. Obviously, there's no such thing as franchise with this one. That's something I leave in for the standard notes. I haven't hit the groove yet. I'm getting there. Don't worry. Right, so... I will discuss the ending once I get into the spoilers, but I will warn verbally and I will put up a spoiler, you know, a bit of text visually. I am aware that many people have watched this movie. The review will still be based on the idea that you have not. And... So, plot. When SID 6.7, Russell Crowe, a virtual reality simulation created using the personalities of nearly 200 serial killers, manages to escape into the real world, one man, Denzel Washington, is tasked with stopping SID. And he, you know, Denzel Washington plays Parker Barnes, a con, pre-con cop, now con ex-cop. I couldn't help it. Yeah, sorry. For those who have no idea what I am. He used to be a police officer, but... He... Yeah, I'll get into exactly what happened later in the video. And now he is in prison, and they're offering him his freedom if he can stop Sid. So, if this movie, you know, if this is something you've never heard of, here are a few things to give you an idea. It's an action movie with fairly typical mid-90s action thriller, you know, action scenes, crime sci-fi movie. It was released in 1995, directed by Brett Leonard, who also directed The Lone Mower Man. And basically, it wanted to combine the hunting down a serial killer story with the virtual reality concept, since both were popular in the years leading up to making this. I'm going to be criticizing this movie a bit, and I just want to make it absolutely clear right up front. It doesn't bother me that the movie is not trying to be Shakespeare. I'm not saying that I'm too good for this movie. Not every science fiction movie needs to be 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's perfectly fine if you would rather make a Transformers movie. It just dawned on me. I, Yeah, for any fellow viewers of Deep Focus Lens, that was... A, that was a comparison she made, and then kind of decried, so, yeah, I don't know. I liked the comparison, I guess. Subconsciously, I placed it there, and it just dawned on me. That's where I got that from. Anyway, if you're going to make a movie that's kind of dumb, you know, first of all, it has to be fun. To be fair, a lot of this movie is very entertaining, but you should also be creative even if you're making you know i know some people say dumb movies don't have to be creative i think a creative dumb movie can be much more entertaining to watch than a really good movie even sometimes when the really good movie is also creative this movie is just nowhere near as creative as it should be considering its concept i just barely remember john M. mnemonic but i certainly do remember that you know, it had some really bizarrely memorable traits, like Dolph Lundgren as a Jesus bro. I'll probably be doing a video on that in a few weeks. You know, I, I started doing my research for that. I found way more, like, quote-unquote, big YouTube videos about that than for this. And I don't think it's an accident that that one is way more remembered than this is. If your dumb movie is creative, I might love it. Like how I love Crank, and especially Crank High Voltage. 
And I thought I would give a couple of examples of dumb sci-fi movies that I love. And just real quick, I realize that some of these are not very similar to this movie. I'm just saying I love dumb sci-fi. When it's creative and, and, you know, yeah. The first Fortress movie, you know, it's it's a B movie. A lot of people call it dumb. I'm not sure that I would personally call it dumb, but, you know, fair enough. Some people call it dumb. Same goes for Darkman 1. And yes, Darkman 3, not Darkman 2, though. I love the Darkest Hour, not the one with, you know, Churchill. Uh, not with Churchill, about Churchill. They did not manage to resurrect Churchill for that movie. And I love Battle LA. At least I did the first time I watched it. I haven't watched it since. Maybe I wouldn't today. Species 1, and yes, Species 2. Not saying they're good movies. Keep in mind, now, some of these are not good movies, but they're, they're dumb sci-fi, and I really enjoy watching them. Just to be clear, I am not saying that this movie is automatically bad for not being as good as The Matrix 1, 2, even 3, or Existence, and it's not even only the fact that while this movie does have a message, the movie doesn't do as good a job of handling it as The Matrix, where in part it's aided by being a metaphor and in part by just, it, it resonated with a lot of people. You know, the idea that human beings are slaves to inhuman machines, whether you read that literally as slaves to computers or more figuratively slaves to faceless, soulless corporations. And Existence, it's just so brilliantly woven into the entire movie. You know, I'm not going to claim that those are not, like, if, if you hadn't watched The Matrix and someone just told you, oh yeah, it's kind of how human beings are slaves to machines, you might, like, be, are they, are they really going to make it that on the nose, that obvious, you know, but it works for the movie and, yeah, X is the, the, I don't think I'm going to be giving away what Existence is saying, but it's just, in that movie, it, yeah, I'll admit, it's it's very on the nose uh, of, uh, as far as messages go, but it just, it works so much better there than it does here, and it sucks because the message of this movie is good it's important i'll i'll get into what exactly it is i believe i will yes before i get into the spoiler section i will say i was kind of confused that the movie barely seems to want to comment on technology it's basically just an excuse for a very standard cop chase a serial killer flick like sid 6.7 comes out of a computer and now he's a serial killer and the rest of the movie is I, I was just, yeah, excuse me, I'm just very briefly going to say I'm not the first person to think of this. I saw at least one critic point it out. Once again, I'm not saying that the movie is bad because it's not The Matrix, but The Matrix made the decision to focus on the simulated reality where this, ta you know, yeah. Th this takes us out of simulated reality very early on, and it's not that much about simulated reality, and it's just kind of weird, because really, the movie could so easily be rewritten. Honestly, I don't think this is the case, but it almost feels like they just kind of plugged virtual reality into an already existing script, you know, like how some you know, sequels to major movies are secretly just, well, you know, they had a script lying around and they just plugged some characters into it to make it sort of be attached to this, you know, this other movie. Yeah, I, I, I barely understand why they bothered to include VR in there. I actually, no, you know what? I think the idea was they felt more confident that a serial killer hunter thriller with some filler 
even if it were iller, would perform better than a movie just straight about VR. And I don't think the Lawnmower Man did particularly well, so they're maybe not completely incorrect in that assumption, although I think that might also be because of how that movie handles VR. I'm, once again, if, if I spoil that movie, I will warn before I do so. It's just, it's very, very strange to me that they even bothered to have VR. You know, thinking about it, I understand why. But it just really seems... Yeah, you know, hedging their bets, basically. VR is popular, but if we make an entire movie about it, people don't like it. Serial killer thrillers are popular. If we combine the two, that'll make money. Now... Yeah, so, the writing. With a high concept like this, obviously there's going to be at least some logic acrobatics to allow the movie to be about this ridiculous concept. And this movie actually does a decent job. Why does, you know, why does Sid have, I think it's like 183, although a bunch of people wrote 200 or over 200. I don't know how they got that number, but whatever. 183, I think, is, is stated in the movie. Serial killer psyches in one being because he's part of a training program for cops so that if they encounter a serial killer, there's a certain chance that he's going to behave the way Sid 6.7 does. Why does he even want to escape into the real world? The program is being shut down because he keeps killing people for real through the virtual world. I'm not really going to claim that it completely makes sense, but at least it's there. They, they bother to think of it. And, you know, the, the let's see, he, he likes the idea of being in the real world as well because, you know, he likes he likes to play. Well, how on earth does an AI get into the real world? He, I suppose, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to give all the details here, but a body is crafted for him using silicone. Think 3D printing. Why are they only sending one person after him? Because Parker Barnes was the, the person who came the closest to stopping Sid in the program. But why only one guy, you know, and, and he... He isn't entirely alone, but he's the only one with a gun. Why only one with a gun? The more people they send, the more attention it attracts. And they don't want people to realize that this is their fault. That, that the killer is out there. They created him, literally. So I will just briefly pause at this point and admit, yeah, that is still, like, logic leaps. But they bother to think, you know, it's not just... You know, like, I don't think every movie needs to justify the, the I, I just think that if you're going to place it in basically the real world, and largely this is set in the real world, you know, in the not-too-distant future of 1999, which at the time was, I don't know, I'm not sure they actually believed that 1999 would look the way it does in this movie, but I, whatever. It's, maybe they wanted the, the thing of, like, I've, I've read a thing about, like, people kind of lose their minds once we get to the start of a new millennium, or rather the end of an old millennium. I think they were probably trying to do that. You know, they wanted the movie out before 1999, but they still wanted that sweet, juicy 1999 maniacal goodness. But yeah, I, not every movie needs to justify it but this is basically set in the real world so you have to make the effort at least and yeah like basically once pretty early in the movie you're going to be asked to buy some of what i've you know briefly described here and basically you're either going to go along with it and enjoy at least some of the movie or you're going to just say, nope, that doesn't make sense, and you're not going to have any fun watching the movie. And you know, I'm not going to claim that everyone can just choose which of those is going to happen. But again, they made the effort. It's not just happening because it's what they want to happen. They made the effort to justify the stuff.
Meanwhile, considering all the similarities between this movie and Demolition Man, it's hard to ignore how much more that movie's concept makes sense for, you know, why is the anti-hero the only person to stop the villain? Anyway, depending on which review you read, the reason that Parker Barnes was in prison is either that he killed the serial killer who killed his family, or that when killing him, he also killed several completely innocent people. I feel like the people who only refer to his act of revenge are kind of neglecting the fact that he killed innocent people. He didn't mean to, but he did it. That you you don't get put you don't get off from being in prison because you didn't mean to do the thing you did. And and I think it's maybe it maybe kind of shows you know it is one of the problems with vigilantism. And I, a lot of the people who somewhat support vigilantism don't like admitting it. I enjoy vigilantism in fiction. I really don't want it in real life. Vigilantism in real life very frequently has collateral damage, and a number of them straight up, they get the wrong person. That's why we have an investigation. Make sure the right person is put on trial, yeah, given their day in court, and that whole thing, you know, kind of important. I guess the following does need saying. I'm not saying that this means that Parker Barnes makes for a bad protagonist, but let's please acknowledge he is an anti-hero. He's not wrongfully in prison. He killed people. He was in prison for killing people, not for getting the bad guy, as some people say. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Just let's please acknowledge it's, it's text. It's not even subtext. The movie specifically says he killed people who were unarmed, who hadn't seemed to kill anyone. Let's see. Now, it is pretty disappointing that the movie actually does the trite trope of let's release a prisoner because he's the best at stopping the villain of the movie. You know, supposedly the reason that it will be necessary for Parker to be released is that, you know, he did the best of the virtual reality training program against Sid, and, you know, considering how interesting the idea of one entity having the combined psyches of 183 killers, some of whom we know were sociopaths, sadists, the movie clearly isn't particularly interested in what made these people kill. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they deserve our empathy. They were killers, some of them sociopaths, sadists, but if you don't understand what made them killers, then we have much less of a chance of preventing others from ending up the same way. And it also, it hurts the movie that some characters are very inconsistent, inconsistently characterized. Sometimes Sid will try to get away from Parker shooting him. Other times he will literally wait for Parker to get there so that they can exchange gunfire. Still without taking cover, it's, yeah. Sometimes regular people in the movie will have very strong reactions to Sid committing his random acts of violence. Other times they'll barely react at all. I legitimately can't figure out why they have such different reactions other than inconsistent writing. I cannot find something in the text of the movie or subtext or anything. It just seems like inconsistent writing. It feels like maybe the... The guy could the, the writer couldn't quite handle the 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 deadline, maybe I I don't know exactly. And sometimes we'll see smart characters make incredibly stupid decisions for no other reason than the writer wrote himself into a corner and didn't feel like, you know, pressing backspace, erasing his work, going back and thinking of a good way to get out of it. You know. Remove the part where you wrote yourself into a corner and just write it differently so that you don't need... Yeah. And the social commentary that it wants to do is really harmed by very superficial writing. They're, they really doesn't seem to understand or care to understand what it's trying to comment on. You know, the movie would be better without the attempt at social commentary because that just makes it frustrating to watch. After a while, the movie starts to feel like it's going out of its way to bring up and then completely waste interesting subjects to explore. It's a movie that I started out enjoying and I really wanted to love, but the further I got into it, the more frustrating it got. 
And for the last third or so, I kind of just wanted the movie to end already. There are some plot twists, and the movie sometimes handles them well, but other times we have the, the excuse me, inconsistent writing. The, the direction of the movie, you know, it handles action and effects well. Characters, maybe not as much, you know, apart from maybe Sid. And the opening helps set up, you know, how creepy Sid is and just, you know, some, some elements about this world. The ending kind of peters out. The the last, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes are really not the, the most compelling action or interesting concepts or the like. And... As far as, you know... It's best when a movie manages to keep your interest throughout. And in this movie, I would say once you realize that the movie isn't really going to do anything interesting, you kind of start to lose interest. Now, Sid has these, you know, a little, little bit of a T-1000 thing going on. You know, his body is silicone so he can reform using glass and he can take a lot of damage without dying and ultimately the movie doesn't use this as much or as interestingly as you know again it kind of feels like they were just they were right they, they surfing the trend i think is the is the term and yeah like they watched t2 and they were like I bet we could do a thing like the T-1000. It's nowhere near as interesting as the T-1000. Let's see. The... Yeah, so... Kelly Lynch plays a criminal psychiatrist. You know, she's fine. I she's not really necessary for the movie. I mean, she's basically there so that she can explain Sid to Parker. You know, and I I've seen others point out her character was massively rewritten. And yeah, the you know, this has an immensely talented cast and they are largely wasted in thankless roles. You know, really, the 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 only person who really like. I'm not saying that Russell Crowe is the only person who could have played this role well, but he sure does play the role well. He's, you know, he's he's one of the most entertaining parts of the movie. And yeah, like. Basically, everyone else, you could have just recast them with, you know, yeah, someone else. You you really didn't need to get, again, I, I figure it was probably like, well, these people put butts in seats, so there, there we go. You know, and that, apparently Denzel took the role because, if, you know, his kid wanted him to. Not sure it said which kid. Is that the kid who was now in Tenet? In that case, I forgive him. It, it was a bad choice for to tell his dad to play, to, to be in this movie, but he's great in Tenet, so. And if not, I, you know, whatever. I, you know, no, no ill will. But yeah, they, they, they really did not need to be. Now, you know, I, I love the work of nearly every single major actor in this. Now, let's see. 
And the, the reason that Sid is able to escape into the real world is that the guy who created him, I mean, there's, there's kind of a hint that he's kind of in love with Sid, which I don't have a problem with. You know, both of them are men. That's not a problem. It just... I don't know, it feels a little... I'm trying to, to be... diplomatic here, so what I will say is I get the sense that we're supposed to think of it as if you are gay you will create something like Sid, and you will want to, you know, release your creation, even though he's, you know, the 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 reason his he's called Sid, S I D. It stands for sadistic, intelligent, and I should have written down what the D stands for. Dangerous, I think. Dangerous. Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with there being a gay character in the movie, but it really I really wish that I didn't didn't get such a vibe of the movie judging him for being gay and saying that gay people have violence in them and want to hurt people. Really? By 1995, we were still doing that. Seriously. Anyway, Russell Crowe is memorably creepy, manic, crazy, sadistic. A lot of people have said he's very reminiscent of the Joker, and it's absolutely true. And, you know, the fact that this came after Batman 89 does maybe, again, say they're friend surfing, but still, he's, he's, yeah, he steals every frame that he, if, if he's in the frame, He's what you're paying attention to, you know. And like a lot of memorable, you know, sociopath characters in fiction, he has charisma. Like, you can understand why, you know, the, the moment that you have a character in fiction who kills people, it's like... Why don't people run away when they see him? Like, how, how, how do people not take one look at him and say, that guy's dangerous, I'm not staying put? He's charis he's charming, you know, he, he, yeah, charismatic. And you, you, he's hard to take your eyes off, you know, which I think, yeah, I'll, I'll get to, Excuse me. And so, yeah, I try to, in these reviews, go over, is this movie just, you know, should, should, you, should you just watch a different movie that, you know, is, is it derivative or is it, you know, unintentionally or otherwise. And obviously, you know, as far as the, the technology is dangerous, virtual reality is dangerous, they'll use it to try to train, you know, someone for, for violence and it's gonna go really badly. And someone, let's see, let's go with someone that people Yeah, never mind. There's not really that much of a of an analog there. But anyway, in some ways Lawnmower Man is more entertaining because certainly that movie does actually use VR. It would be very difficult to rewrite Lawnmower Man to not have VR. Where this movie, boy, would it be easy. Like really unbelievably easy just like one rewrite and Sid is just an escaped mental patient instead of you know that they're really yeah 
for a lot of this movie, it's very similar to Demolition Man. You've got one psychopath running around in a society that, you know, there is there is a reason why this society doesn't stop him. And you have an anti-hero who, you know, might be dangerous to people. Like, maybe there's some collateral damage or something being released to take him down. And I mean... At least Demolition Man, you have Stallone, you have Wesley Snipes. I guess as far as the action, I suppose, now I would say Demolition Man is at least a little better than this, but this does have very strong action. And I mean, both of them have social commentary. I probably shouldn't comment on the social commentary that I'm still ruminating on I'm still I'm I'm not 100% sure what that movie is trying to say with its satire or social commentary and I think I will hold off on discussing it until I feel more sure about it I don't want to you know look like a jackass, like one of the critics who completely misunderstood the point of Starship Troopers. That's that's still comical to me, that there were actual paid critics. I don't have a problem with critics, but occasionally, I'm sorry, they really put their foot in their mouths. Wait, they write their uh, keyboard in their mouths. I don't know, is that how that goes? Boy, did they miss the point of that movie, some of them. But I have nothing against critics. I just, I, I, sometimes we should criticize critics, but there's not some major, there's no conspiracy. They're not, there we go. They're not rating certain movies certain ways because they're being paid to, yeah. Outside, you know, there, there are a couple of times where Stallone has shown that he's, he actually has acting talent. It's, it's wild that he can give really strong performances in some roles and, and just not in other roles. But I would, I maintain him as, I, I'm not sure if many people are arguing with me over this, but Rocky Balboa and John Rambo he can he can really play those roles with a lot of depth and soul when really a lot of people would have just phoned it in would have just been like oh you know rocky's kind of an idiot who uses violence and john rambo you know he's he's a killer and he's dangerous okay i'll you know but stallone actually you know, try to imbue them. He, he tried to go deeper than that, and he did really great. In most most cases, Denzel Washington is a far better actor than Stallone, but he's nowhere near as fun in roles like this, unless we're talking Training Day or Inside Man. Absolutely love that movie. I actually rewatched it just a few days ago. And I, I tell myself it's so that I could compare Denzel Washington performances, but I just wanted a, a, an excuse to... I don't even need an excuse to watch Inside Man. There's there's some chance that I'll... that I will do a video on it, because that movie really has a lot. There's, there's so much, such high-quality work on display in that movie. You know, Denzel is known for his dis disarming charm, and that's not really present in this. He, yeah, I mean, I've seen, you know, some say that he sleepwalks through the movie. I think there's a, an argument to be made for that, but they just, they really don't give him very much. The, the tragic backstory for that, he he really sells it, but for the rest of it, it's just completely bland. Like, it could be anyone, you know, chasing down Sid, basically. There's, there's so little 
yeah. Then again, maybe this is the closest we'll get to Denzel Washington and or Russell Crowe doing, you know, a comic book movie. And I'm really glad to see when respected actors do that. You know, comic book movies should not be seen as lesser, and this really helps. Okay, so... That... yeah, let's see. I did, in fact, write some about the satire in... Demolition Man, and I think I'm just going to hang on to that for if I feel confident, excuse me, at a later date that I have understood the movie and not fallen for, yeah. So the special effects are obviously a pretty big deal of the movie. At the time, they thought it looked incredible, and, you know, it's, it's, very dated today. I will say that the movie does not rely that much on CGI, which, I mean, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm trying, I'm really trying to balance, like, saying positive things, but also kind of just being completely brutally honest here. Part of the reason it doesn't rely that much on CGI is that it doesn't have that much where it's specifically about like new technology stuff that they couldn't just reproduce on set you know but the effects they they they're they're memorable and kind of like sometimes they're kind of creepy sometimes they're kind of cool you know, obviously helps a lot if you can put yourself in the mindset of watching it when it was new. Although even so, I was alive in 1995. I don't think I watched this back then, but even at the time, I would have been like, okay, I can tell when it's real and when it's CG. But there are some... The, the, yeah, this is not a spoiler. There's an early scene where someone is basically sort of, they basically they're they're in a virtual reality environment, and they're being, let's say there's there, there's a maybe, I guess the word is a disruption, of the signal, because the, you know they're not physically in VR they're, you know they're being put in there, and as the computer is trying to hold on to the signal, but it's being disrupted, there's some really kind of creepy, you know, stuff in there. And, you know, you could say, oh, but, you know, they could have done that with, like, practical, you know, practical effects. But it is supposed to look a little, you know, not, not fake, which it kind of does, but it is supposed to look like it's coming out of a computer. It's not supposed to look, you know, practical effects are great for making us believe that the thing is real, you know, but yeah, it makes a lot of sense to use computer animation if you're trying to make it look like computer animation. And yeah, I, I ultimately, I wish they had been slightly more restrained with the CG, but this, you know, it really doesn't overuse CG, I would say. I, I suppose, okay, there may be parts of the movie. There's, I guess, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to say when, but there are parts of the movie when it does, yeah. where it does perhaps use it a tad too much. But then even... You know what? No. I am... I'm putting my foot down and hoping it doesn't end up in my mouth. I don't think the movie relies too much on CG. And I... Yeah. I, I do think that that is a, a good thing. Because the... Yeah. Even though part of it is that there's not... Yeah, but no, really. There are some scenes where they could have gone 
all in and they instead choose to go for a little but make it effective instead of just because a lot of movies that were coming out around this time they were basically like have you ever had a friend who like for a while it's not that they were like overweight but they were just you know they 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 weren't like big they, they weren't like muscly and such and then they did start working out and once they started working out they couldn't stop flexing their muscles they had to constantly show off that's kind of what cg was like in the 90s in movies and yeah i admire them for in this case saying no we're gonna we're gonna just do a little i i think there's a decent chance that in months months from now i will still remember at least some of the cg from this it will legitimately stick out in my mind but the movie is not exactly helped by Hollywood's lack of understanding of technology and computers and a stunning amount of terribly written and poorly delivered techno babble. It is legit, like, it's, it's incredible. The, the stuff they will say with a mostly straight face in this movie and it'll legitimately, like, I realized that there were normal people who also didn't know what these words meant really back then but you can st it's even at the time it was very awkward to hear them say this stuff and today when we know what these words mean it's just completely yeah the stunt work is quite good there there are several major stunts in the movie that yeah, they they actually, they they, you know, good stunt work adds that extra bit of oomph to you know like. There's just something in your in your brain that like likes when it looks like someone could have gotten hurt, even though logically you know that it's a movie they didn't get hurt. And yeah, the they do a good job of that in this. And also don't end up relying on it. Now, they have some... They have a fairly decent variety of settings in this. You know, you have some virtual reality environments. You have a number of places around... You know, it's, it's set in a city. So, you know, you've got some public transportation. You've got a nightclub. Uh, there are a couple of other places. I'm not sure how much more I should give away. And, uh, yeah, you know, some of these are pretty decent locations. And I would say that the sets, it, it never feels fake in a way that it's not meant to. Like, the virtual reality environments, you can kind of tell, okay, this is not real, but it's supposed to not look real. And it's it, it works. Like, legitimately, the, the... Man, I wish that there was more VR in this, because it really works when they use it. The kind of fake-y kind of... Like, basically... A lot of it looks practically photo real, but then there are these little things where, like, you can tell that the people who came up with this stuff had played video games from the 90s, and they were aware that some things did not look natural. Like, today, you know, like, I... Today you have photorealistic graphics in some video games, you know. There's, there's stuff where, like, if you, if you don't know if what you're looking at is, you know, a video game cutscene or a scene from a movie, and you don't look very, very carefully, you might, you know, briefly actually think that what you're watching is a real thing, you know. And here I'm speaking, of course, of animated cutscenes. I'm not talking about FMV and that kind of thing 
But then, yeah, back in, in the 90s, I played many, many 90s games. Back then, there were things that did not look natural, and in this movie, when you see the VR world, there are a couple of things where it's like, okay, that was not, we're, we're supposed to know that this is not real. And the action scenes are swiftly cut, reasonably, reasonably, fairly well directed, and, I mean, it's... It's not on the level of, like, dedicated action directors. I already mentioned Terminator 2, you know. James Cameron would have made the action work even better in this movie than, I want to say, Brett Leonard was the director. But he does a pretty decent job. You know, it delivers on 90s action scenes. You have, you, you, you know, you've got chases, gunfights, hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, yeah. Sadly, it is somewhat emotionally empty, which is too bad considering how much better The Matrix does at it when, again, both of them have some of this, like, action that isn't happening in the real world, you know. But, yeah, the the if you don't mind that it is basically emotionally empty, like, yeah, it's it's legitimately enjoyable. Yeah. And parts of the movie are genuinely creepy and, like, disturbing. Now. The movie is largely easy to follow. And, you know, it's meant to be. And since it is... So much of it is a straightforward action movie. I think that was the right choice. Now, the music, certainly some of it is quite good. There's They, they use some, you know, 90s rock, aggressive rock to... I'm, I'm not a music critic, so I don't know what exactly what... Punk rock, maybe, some of it, I don't know. To, to like... I mean, basically, when Sid is doing his thing, aggressive rock music plays. If if it's if he's just getting to have fun, and you're wondering if someone will be able to stop him, then that kind of music plays, and that works really well. And there's some pretty decent dark comedy. Now, the, the violence in the movie is fairly, you know, it, it gets quite brutal, and clearly we're supposed to enjoy it, and it's supposed to be cathartic. And, yeah, it's, it's very bloody and violent. There's not a ton of gore, but, yeah, and it's very graphic. It doesn't imply it shows a lot of the time. The pacing is fine. You know, the the story moves at a at a pretty good pace. And yeah, so the movie is I'll say 96 movies long if you don't stay through the end credits. And I mean if you if you have that amount of time and you, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to say during like, Corona lockdown, but if you're watching this at some magical point in the future when the virus is under control, if you have that time to spare and you've watched every other movie very similar to this and you don't want to rewatch any of those, I guess watching it like you you could do worse certainly and let's see it's 
So yeah, the the best element of the movie and whether it would be worth watching the movie at least once just to experience that. Yeah. Like I said, the action is fairly enjoyable and you know, you can laugh at the the bad like you know, the bad techno babble, for example. Mm. Yeah. As I'm talking about the best element, I should explain why I don't say that the best element is the message of the movie. The movie is definitely trying to comment on the human fixation with violence and how the media feeds that drive, leading to increasingly violent content. But the movie really doesn't do a good job of exploring this theme. I know I'm a broken record here, but if you want strong exploration of that theme, watch Alejandro Amenabar's thesis. He, you know, he's perhaps most well known for the. Actually, no, you know what? I am not 100% certain because I have not watched his most recent stuff, so I don't know. For a while, he was perhaps most famous as the guy who directed the the movie Open Your Eyes, which was Hollywoodized into the very inferior Vanilla Sky. And he went on to direct The Others, which is his most Hollywood film and his work from before then, I've personally found to be more compelling. But once again, I have not watched, I, I need to catch up on his more recent movies, but yeah. And Sinister, you know, by the director of Doctor Strange 1 is also... The, the, it's, it's an incredibly important subject and it's important to have movies that explore it well and Thesis and Sinister just do a much better job of it than this movie does. L like I said, it's, it's very surface reading how this movie does, you know, it's, it's, I guess, was, was it just a 90s thing? Because the 90s also had Mad City, which is also very, you know, the Dustin Hoffman movie. And, and, you know, Dustin Hoffman, John Travolta. And, yeah, like, the, the that movie is also... <laughs> I mean, I, at least that movie is more, like, straight focused on that, where this movie, like, there are... There's, there are chunks of this movie that feel like they aren't really particularly interested in that, whereas that movie is specifically about it from start to finish, but yeah. And yeah, so the worst aspect, I would say, is the frustrating writing and the, yeah, the fact that after a while, just if you, if you can't really deliver something that that has like a strong emotional impact again i'm not saying that every action movie has to be you know james cameron level or something but i'm not saying he's the best action director ever i'm saying he did action movies in the 90s you know it's it's the it just after a while gets you know, you, you end up kind of feeling like, you know, I, I can't really say that the movie's overlong because it does, you know, it's not much more than 90 minutes. And if it's shorter than 90 minutes, it's, you know, excuse me, movies shorter than 90 minutes are not that common in, you know, I feel like I've read somewhere that technically feature length movie doesn't mean 90 minutes it actually just means over 45 minutes but i cannot think of a single movie i've seen in theaters it, you know actual theaters not like 
you know, art kind of, you know, that was less than, that was much less than 90 minutes. I guess 80 minutes would be the, the very bare minimum, I think, yeah. But I think what it boils down to is if you can't imbue your action scenes with if if they don't resonate, if they don't if if they are basically soulless and empty, maybe you shouldn't be directing action scenes, you know. And and again, like clearly Brett Leonard I I don't know about today, but in the nineties he had something I was about to say he had something to say, but I'm not 100% certain if I would go that far. But he was, he clearly cared. He cared about VR. Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe he wished that more of this movie was VR, and that's why a number of the, the action scenes just felt like they're, they're kind of contractual obligation kind of thing, more than passion, because... The VR stuff, like, you can tell, okay, he is loving directing this. He, he just, the way that, yeah, you know, and, and it's just kind of, yeah. And I, I kind of wish he had gotten to make more movies. You know, I, I, I'm aware that there's at least, there's one, maybe two other movies he's done that are about V, that, that have that sort of VR thing. Maybe I'll try to watch them at some point. But this and Lawnmower Man, I mean, clearly he cared about that. And, like, if he had made at least one that, like, blew people away, that everyone loved, maybe he would have made more of them, you know, but, yeah. I, let's see, that brings us. Yeah, so I try to, yeah, I try to close out my reviews with a recommendation. You know, who would I re recommend it to? Who wouldn't I recommend it to? Back when it came out, it was for people who were scared that virtual reality was being developed. Today, you know, you, you kind of have to enjoy... And, you know, if you enjoy 90s action movies and you like the whole, you know, lone cop hunting down a serial killer thing, I would say you can definitely get some enjoyment out of it. And, you know, if you want to see Russell Crowe play the Joker, you know, yeah. But other than that, I, you know, if I was doing this review in 1995, I would probably still be saying... I don't know if this is necessarily, like, if you enjoy the action scenes, if you think you might enjoy the action scenes, you know, it's, it's enjoyable, but the, yeah, I think that pretty much covers, yeah, so, I rate this seven ill-conceived AIs. Out of ten, yes, I still do go that high for this one because there really is some stuff there to really, really enjoy. And that brings us to the spoilers. And I am just going to write a note time code. Yes, so, disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'm not trying to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice to the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. And with that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie will be in this section. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And yeah, so from here on out, spoilers. And 
But if I spoil anything other than this movie, I will warn and hold up a finger. It'll be finger time. Now, let's see. I don't have a problem with violence and gore in general. The thing is one of my favorite horror movies and movies in general. I also love Cronenberg's The Fly, Video Drone, etc. And I don't have a problem with disturbing and upsetting material in general. Monster is one of my favorite movies. I probably will swear at least some in this video. And... Yeah, instead of me quoting all the lines that are legitimately, often unintentionally funny, in this movie, you know, I'm just, you know, if you go to the IMDb memorable quote section, you can look up, you know, instead of me quoting all the lines that, yeah, based on my review, you can probably tell which one I found funny. And, hmm, yeah, so this is where I usually go into, you know, movies that are similar to this that I've watched and you know the IMDB more like this list you know strikes out again so the yeah compared it to several movies most of which I haven't watched the two that I had watched are The Siege from 1998 and Crimson Tide I mean yeah Denzel Washington is the good guy in all three of them. I that's that's about all that they have to. Yeah. Oh, and all three are message movies, and all three kind of handle their message a little awkwardly, even though they have the right idea. Fair enough. They were more similar than I thought. Now, but yeah, you know. Uh, broken record here, but if you want a movie that comment, you know, for a movie that comments on the, the violence, you know, thesis or sinister, for a movie that has, you know, virtual reality and th this kind of thing, see, I am not 100% certain. Okay, so The Matrix is overall the better movie, but Existence I love almost as much as I love The Matrix. So yeah, those let's let's give those a tie. That's that's two ties. And yeah. I'm sorry, but if we're talking least favorite movie like this, yeah, this movie is just yeah. Now, I record this as soon as I can get to the computer after watching the movie. And yeah, so to make it clear, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MSC for gay riff tracks and other jokes. And the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. So the very next section after this is thoughts I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary or live tweeting or the like. Sec se next section is thoughts I have while before. I was in the groove. I slipped out of it. I'm getting back into it. Thoughts that I had before watching. And the final section I get into stuff I think is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. And... Let's see. So, yeah, the Yeah, so this is one of the movies where the women are not depicted particularly, 
you know, base like for a lot of it, you basically have. I want to say her name. Say her name is Madison, the the psychiatrist. For a lot of it, she seems capable, but then she just starts crying when things. It it just it felt. Excuse me. I get it. I get that losing a child is one of the greatest fears of any parent. I just don't think that it felt. You know, it it basically felt like it was betraying the character the, the characterization of her up to that point she had seemed very strong and capable you know when she like she basically she gets to go along with parker barnes despite the you know the, the others really don't want her to and she manages to talk her way that she you know reason her way into that situation so she seems like, um, you know, and, and when Sid is like, you know, a, a major threat, she's like, calm, you know, yeah, yeah, calmly driving the car, speeding to catch up to him, even though she knows he has a gun and he's clearly, you know, but the moment that, you know, it just, it feels like the writer thinks that women deep down are all weak. And it, you just gotta press the right button and they start crying. I'm sorry, but there are parents who, even when finding out their child might be in a lot of danger, are not going to start crying. Like, yeah, she, she basically, like, she cries and she, like, you know, goes into Parker's, you know, arms. And it's just, yeah, it, it's like honestly it kind of feels like the rest of the role was supposed to be played by a man but then they decided that the the yeah yeah and then i don't think this is what happened i'm just saying this is what it makes me think then near the end you know as the as the writer is writing you know oh and then a child gets kidnapped oh wait what if it was a child of one of the characters Oh, I should make the psychiatrist a woman, and then she starts weeping. It's just, and other than that, you know, most of the women are sexualized. You know, you have, I'm sorry, I forget her name, Louise Fletcher, I want to say, Nurse Ratched, basically play, you know, this. I'm not saying that only women are shown as like emotionally cold when they're you know I'm just saying when you show a woman being emotionally cold it sends the message that she's failing at being a woman you know women are supposed to be warm and caring so a cold woman is worse than a cold man and it you know the character didn't even need to be a woman there's nothing you know, if, you, if you're not going to represent, if you're not going to have a positive representation, you know, yeah, I mean, the, the character could so easily just be a male character, you know, if, if you're not going to make some interesting, yeah. And the, yeah, I'm not going to go too much into it, but, you know, you've got Sheila... 3.2 you've got the the you know there the the women at the dance club you've got the the you've got the woman at the at the MMA ring yeah it's just the the you know they're basically there to look attractive and and it's it's this super hypocritical thing where like we're supposed to look at Sid, you know, going up to these attractive women, and like, I saw someone point out, maybe it was off the shelf reviews, is Sid about to like, bite that one woman on the neck? Does he think that he has fangs? We don't really see how it plays out, he's, you know, some people show up, so he stops, but like, I'm not saying I've tried, 
but I'm pretty sure not very much would actually happen. Maybe, maybe he just wants to give her a hickey. I don't know. But yeah, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, sit, you know, get. We get to sit and and judge Sid for going up and you know, treating these women badly, whilst at the same time the camera is objectifying these women. So, you know, we're we're supposed to think of them as objects like Sid is doing, you know, it's, yeah. And I suppose, yeah, there are also a few, you know, ethnic minorities that, you know, the, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Parker Barnes' hair once I get into the, the next section. But the, the, there's a Native American talking about, like, he's, I'm, I, you know, he's basically arguing for, you know, he's, he's arguing that immigration can be a good thing. I, I just feel like it's, the, the, they, they go a little hard on the signifiers. It feels very token if it, it also feels a little bit like they're saying that if you're not yourself an ethnic minority you don't care about immigration and then at the same time i mean native americans did not immigrate to america they you know they were decimated when you know the pilgrims immigrated to america so yeah i don't know it just it and it's also just, part of what bothers me is that it doesn't actually want to talk about immigration at all. It just, it's just dropping it in there as a, yeah, but I'll get more into that. Now, I think that the, you know, obviously a movie like this, you know, you it has to have Sid hurt someone every so often so that the audience is still like on a rush of uh, adrenaline of like oh you know someone has to stop him soon kind of thing and you know we have a few like the the cops will find uh, you know bodies left by him and you know to really hit home that he is a dangerous serial killer I feel like the movie does a, a decent job at that. You know, if, if you get into it as one cop hunting down a serial killer, it basically delivers pretty well on that. Yeah. And, you know, an, another thing is if, you know, if, if it shows Sid, the more it shows Sid, the greater the chance of diminishing returns and I don't, I wouldn't really say the movie gets, which is another reason I give it a 7 out of 10 instead of like 6 or something. Because at the end of the day, yeah, from the very start of the movie to the very end of the movie, Sid is creepy and scary and you just want him stopped. And it, it works on that, you know. I, if I hadn't watched this movie, I don't know that I would have thought that Russell Crowe could play a role quite like this, but it was this, you know, I've, I've seen some of the, some of the reviews point out he knew that any American movie he gets to might be the last one, you know, so he has to try to really make it, make the most of it, and, and really, and yeah, you know, I don't know how much, I haven't read the script, I don't know how much of it was on the page and what he himself came up with, but it's a very memorable performance and yeah you want him stopped because he's dangerous he leaves behind these you know the all these dead bodies he he kills people in public and doesn't think twice and all this and you can understand why you know people would like Yeah, you know, he, he's charismatic, so you can understand why people, you know, want to pay attention to him. 
Now, I got this movie on sale. So, anything negative I say in this video, it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. You know, yeah, I've already said, but it bears repeating. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some kind of personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Maybe I should move that up in the in the notes for the future because by the time I get to it, I've already said, yeah, I think I will do that. I. I text reviewed this movie in 2009. I'm not certain if that was the very first time I watched it. But, yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure I've... Between that viewing and this one, I'm not 100% sure I've watched it. But if I have, at most, twice. But for sure, two viewings at least. And, you know, I just watched it, so it's fresh in my mind. And, let's see, I guess, yeah, that brings us to the next section, title, notes taken while watching. Neat effects on the opening credits, and it was an interesting choice to have them over blurry footage, and then, you know, you, you kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a natural reflex when we see something that we can't completely make out to try to gather as much information about it, because the, the lizard brain is saying that might be dangerous, so you better, you don't necessarily have to go closer to it, but just try to see if you can figure out what is going, you know. So we look at all these blurry shots of, and the camera, is the camera static? I think the camera might be static throughout that whole bit. So we just see these blurry shapes of these people in gray suits, and we can't see for sure, but once it goes into focus and the movie itself starts, you pretty quickly gather basically all of the people in this, you know, Except for the, the sushi place. But out outside of that, everyone is wearing the same, you know, okay, so the, the women are wearing skirts, but the excuse me, men are wearing pants, but otherwise, it's the same suit. You know, not just the same color, but the, like, I don't know, make, model, whatever they're called. I'm not a, I don't know very much about clothes. I don't care about clothes. They cover the body and they keep you warm, and I appreciate that, and that's pretty much all I need to know about them. So the, the but yeah, you know, they're wearing the same suit, and you kind of get like, you know, the programmers maybe like copy-pasted the, the because it's not what's important, you know, so, but that's a, that's a neat little thing, like you, if you don't know before going in, and I had forgotten that the movie opens in virtual reality, you know, you, you kind of feel like there's something a little off from before the, but yeah, it was, it was a, you know, it, if you, if it was the only thing you had seen of the movie, like if you, if you start watching it and you're like, oh, it's blurry, I don't want to watch it and you turn it off, then you might think it's just technical incompetence. But it's a very deliberate choice, you know, instead of having the credits run over the movie itself, they have this little bit that kind of, you know, we're, we're paying special attention because we're not used to seeing something blurry in a, in a, and it's the entire shot. It's not like the background. No, everything is blurry. And then once you start to, once, once it comes into focus and you start seeing things, then it's like, oh, there's there's something going on here. This is not quite real, you know. Very creepy, almost real virtual reality that we're in at the start. And why isn't more of the movie like this? 
I mean, other than the effects budget. Actually, no, I mean, a bunch of it they could have done, because it's not constantly effects. Like, you have effects during the, the sushi, but other than that, it's just a bunch of extras in the same suit. And yeah, it's a it's a good scene, you know, Sid like literally one of the very first things we see Sid do is you know, Denzel's par Parker's partner is parked in the you know, he he gets this like ah uh, what's it called? Like the the you know, too much electricity. It's it he gets put in the room with electricity. The problem is there's too much electricity. So, I don't know, he should have been wearing a hat, I guess. And he dies, he, he, get his, he gets fried in the real world. You know, that's legitimate, like, that's such good characterization. He knows that what, Sid knows that he's not in the real world, he's stuck in a computer. And he's just gonna have to deal with these, you know, people coming in and, and trying to shoot him, well, he's going to have a little fun. So he figures out a way to kill someone for real from the virtual reality. See, see, ah, there's something, he's, they have such an interesting core there, and they just, after, you know, after a while, they just have him going around to different places where he can get some, some audience attention, and then he does something cruel, and the movie hypocritically gets both the, like, you know, we, we get the, the, ah, what's it called? I guess the word isn't catharsis, it's vicarious. We get the vicarious experience of that, whilst at the same time the movie is, like, going tut, tut, tut. It's not nice to watch violence, it's just, yeah. The, let's see, there was something else I wanted to say, but, but yeah, you know, so yeah, Sid kills Parker's partner, and then the two of them go up against each other, and it's an interesting choice that Parker shoots the sushi chef so that he can get to Sid, and Sid, again, instead of just like, you know, he knows that if he just kills Parker, Parker just goes out of the program, so instead, I want to say, did he grab him by the throat or something, and, and the program starts, those were legitimately, like, again, not the best effects in the world, but it was, like, you can tell, like, he's struggling against and trying to, you know, like, the, the, trying to stay in the program, but it's, like, just that, that whole thing was very, very, nicely done the it's such a clever detail that Sid manages to find a way to hurt someone even though he isn't in the real world and I do think that it would have been more interesting if he hadn't gotten into the real world or at least maybe he should have only gotten into the real world later it's just it's so much of the movie it, it's so much more interesting anyway I can't help but feel like them having Denzel, ah, I'm sorry, I forget, I want to say they're cornrows, and it's sort of seen as this, you know, that's very, that's a very black hairdo. I can't help but feel like they're using that as kind of conflating, you know, black culture as a signal, you know, they're, they're, using black culture as a signifier of danger of something that's not acceptable in society which is really gross and the movie isn't even about racism it's not even comment on it but you know once he's out I, I forget I don't know his hair that much but his hair is just yeah I think I mean that's Denzel's normal hair that's that's how he usually has his hair I feel like I don't know the the um, you know, that's more socially acceptable. I kind of like the relationship between Forsyth 
and Parker, you know, this friendship where Forsyth is willing to put himself out there to try to help because he knows that Parker deserves it, even though everybody else looks at him and sees a convict. You know, and he briefly does believe that Parker snapped and killed that woman, but, you know, he does go and help once talking to Madison. She convinces him. Pretty decent tension in VR and in the fight between Denzel and Nazi Khan. And both action scenes, pretty good. You know, yeah, so the, sh yeah, the shootout in the sushi place and Denzel and Nazi fighting. Yeah, in, in general, the, the action is, is good. And they, I mean, I, I would say that they manage a pretty good variety, but then I guess it's kind of just ticking all the boxes, isn't, isn't it? That, yeah, you know, people like some shootouts, they like chases, they, you know, they like hand-to-hand, -hand, yeah, it's... And when you see, you know, the, the, yeah, so after the fight between Parker and the Nazi Khan, the, the guards beat him with batons, even though he isn't doing anything. I mean, yeah, he's holding the Nazi Khan in place because the Nazi Khan came in with a, ash, I always forget, Shiv or Shank, I forget. I'm gonna, so what I usually do is just call it a shank shiv. That way I'm both right and wrong. And the, so, <clears throat> excuse me, does that only make sense in my head? What I'm saying is, if I say both, then one of them is right, but by saying both, I can be sure that the other one is wrong. I don't know. Maybe it's it's a it's an inside joke. I'm not sure if it's particularly funny to anyone else. The Nazi showed up with a shank shiv. You know, if if Parker lets him go, he might try to stab him. You know, but yeah. So the the guards come in. They beat him with the batons, even though he isn't doing anything. And I kind of start to wonder if the movie is actually saying that some convicts deserve our empathy. But I guess it's just. The ones who used to be cops. I mean, it's not saying that black convicts deserve empathy because cornrows and... Because, you know, I do get the sense that at least some of the guards knew there would be that fight. And, you know, the... the yeah, they beat Denzel the Parker even though the fight is already over. They must have known that he wasn't the one with the shank shiv, since one of them was literally watching him go in. You know, the, there was a scan. He did not have any weapons. I mean, I will say, I feel like the movie did not make that much use of the robot arm. Or am I just having trouble remembering the parts? Yeah, anyway. And... You know, as far as we see, they don't punish the Nazi. They're not in a hurry to beat him with batons. Like, hypothetically, if the Nazi Khan had been real quick, he could have grabbed the Shank Shiv and stabbed Parker while the guards were focusing on Parker. You know, while he wouldn't be able to defend himself. So, yeah. And... I gotta say, I love... Russell Crowe's performance and the CG, like, ah, implement, implementation, I feel like, is, is the word. And I be careful not to slip into any techno battle myself. I really love how they just freak out over, oh, Sheila, she's interactive. I think they think that word might be more exciting than it actually is. Like, literally, if you can press on a button and it does a thing, then that's interactivity. The fact that, it, you know, okay, she's an interactive character, but the word interactive is not that interesting. It's just a descriptor. I mean, you might as well say, she, 
her right hand is her dominant hand. I mean, it's, it's, you're not wrong, but it's just like, maybe, like, why didn't he just say she's really intuitive? Because that's something that a lot of computers have trouble with. But then he did just say, oh, it's, it's like scanning. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I, I, you know, Russell Crowe and the CG, when, when he's in the VR world, it's just so much fun. Like, ah, I'm having trouble remembering examples. But, like, there's a thing he, th like, he throws and catches, throws and catches, and then, like, throws away, and it becomes a different thing. I mean, he has a level of control over the VR world, basically. And, you know, he does the, the backwards jump and like yeah he's he's playing a piano and then it turns into bats and flies away it's just like like you excuse me you get the sense that he has a sense of humor about this whole thing now the yeah so and i do think that they did a you know i was worried that i was that i would miss the interaction between now I did it. Now I, okay. I'm gonna try not to overuse the word interaction, because now that I think about it, they kind of do. They kind of do need to use it at least some. Anyway, Russell Crowe like using the CG. I was worried I was gonna miss that once he's no longer in VR, but it was fun to see him interacting with real objects and real people as well. Parker has to say that he was defending himself three times before Madison finally accepts it. But you do realize she is there to help, you know. Since there really isn't going to be a love story between Parker and Madison, I don't know why they left in their hands touching briefly. I'm not sure how much I'm going to talk about that, but apparently there was supposed to be like a romance thing going on. And Denzel was worried that an interracial relationship would hurt the movie's box office. Excuse me. And, yeah, so the first time you watch it, if you don't know that Parker killed someone... You know, you don't know exactly what they're saying, you know, what he might do again, but it's it's a pretty decent setup that, you know, they are worried that he's going to go out there and kill someone again. And he says, you know, it won't happen again since wife and daughter are already dead, which is not the most reassuring that, yeah, that's where he is an anti-hero for at least... I guess, yeah, I guess the writer realizes that he's an anti-hero because that's really not, like, that basically does mean that hypothetically, if, if he felt that same pain again, somehow he might kill someone by accident again. But yeah, I mean, I guess that's him being really honest. But I really wish that the rest of the movie wasn't stupid about handling this decent setup. Honestly, maybe they should have gone, like, full anti-hero and, like, maybe he does actually hurt someone in order to get to Sid. And then, like, actually, yeah, if, like, if there was a thing where near the end, like, let's say that when he and Sid are both on the, you know, in instead of the bomb diffusing, Sid and he are both on top of the... I, I don't remember what it's called. I used to know. Now, now it's just a subject that I used to know. Wow, that's a data reference even for me. And the... Yeah, like, Sid has a hostage because he thinks to him, you know... Yeah, yeah, because he... And, and he he's actually saying to, ben, to, to Parker, we both know you can't kill... You know, you, you can't shoot through... The hostage and you can't shoot around it you know because you're a changed man so how are you gonna stop me and then Parker says 
I ain't changed that much. And he, sorry, that was... Who said I was changed? Something like that. And he shoots through the hostage and, it, you know, manages to stop Sid because of it. And the other cops show up and they're like, you shot the hostage. And he's like, it was, you know, by doing that, I saved, you know, countless lives. And, like, he puts his hands on his head and he accepts going back to prison or something. I'm not saying that's a good moral, but at least there would be that, I mean... The fact that he actually, you know, they're worried he's going to kill again. And so you have that stupid thing with, I mean, clearly the bullet came from the other direction. And then William Forsythe says, you didn't see what happened. Maybe she turned around. It's just, come on, man. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. The, the, the circumstances were different. I'm not saying it was okay what he did. He should have watched where... He should have looked before he shot, which is that the movie could have commented on how people who use guns sometimes accidentally shoot the wrong person because they're so certain that they're shooting the right person, but it doesn't go anywhere. Why? It's just, it's so frustrating. I wish that the movie actually commented on these things. But yeah, the circumstances are completely different. He didn't shoot the hostage that was with Sid because he was... You know, if, if did he shoot at all? I'm I'm not 100% certain if he fired his gun at all. But the reason that it happened when he was dealing with Grimes was that I I guess he basically felt like everyone who's in Grimes' base must be dangerous. So he didn't wait to look and see that they had cameras, not guns, and he accidentally shoots them. Again, not making excuses here. It's just... So, because he... Again, like... Is the movie saying that people are unwilling to give convicts... Con... Sorry. Convicts... Second chances? The movie gets so close, you know? The movie gets so close to having something really intelligent to say, and then it just screws it up because it's so hard to believe. I'm sorry, but you, what the world you've shown up to that point does not seem like a world where all these people would so easily believe that Parker shot that woman. You know, some, some of them say, he shot her in cold blood. She was a host, like... Why would you think that Parker shot her in cold blood instead of figuring that Sid killed her? Just, it, it, it boggles the mind. It is mind-boggling to me that the, the movie gets so close to, to having something intelligent to say. And then every so... Like, was this written by more than one person? Did, did like, every so often, like, the 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 jock older brother of the writer come in and like, you know, let, let me see what you're writing, dork, and like push him away. This is really important. I'm writing a really good movie. It's going to be really smart. And then he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to write something really stupid. Just what is, what is this script? Like, I, it boggles the mind. You know, again, it's a legitimate, it's a good setup. He killed the sushi chef, even though he was supposed to pretend he was real. And, you know, he, he literally, you know, you, you shot the sushi chef, he wasn't real. And it's just, it's this thing of, you know, like, would he actually do that in real life if it might help him? And just, wow, just, yeah, I feel like the, the they had something intelligent. And then, like, no, it was probably an executive. An executive went over and was like, too smart. People aren't going to understand it. You have to dumb it down. And instead of removing the smart thing, he just follows it up with a stupid thing instead. Let's see. I'm not, I don't have a lot to say 
about the fact that they put a chess game in the background of the sex bot. I just want to acknowledge that they put a chess game in the background of the sex bot because I I don't know why they put a chess game in the background of the sex bot. It it confuses me. I I I'm not sure the person who came up with that knows how computers work. Is that the thing? They didn't want to make it too realistic because, like, their wife is going to watch the movie and they're going to be like, oh, I don't know. I guess that's what it looks like. I've certainly never seen one of those for real. Just, there's a chess game in the background of the sex bot. That is, that is a thing that's in this movie. And it keeps calling attention to it because you keep hearing the the next move on the chessboard called out did someone dare the writer to fit in chess is that what's going on i know it can't be that he binged queen's gambit because that hadn't come out yet unless he's a time traveler but i'm just inventing a better movie here there's a chess game in the background of the sex bot. That's, that's, I, I don't, I'm going to move on from the fact that there's a, a chess game in the background of the sex bot. Because I am never going to be able to make sense of the fact that there is a chess game in the background of the sex bot. I hope you didn't make a drinking game out of, excuse me, every time, every time I said that whole thing. Too much? Maybe too much. I can't always tell. And I'm resisting the urge to do a an impersonation of Jim Carrey as the Riddler, saying I can never tell. I'm sorry, but Sheila 3.2 is just an excuse to have the movie include sexy stuff to appeal to the presumed straight male viewer when they could so easily have had something interesting with commenting on how a lot of men prefer a sex object to an active partner. Just how many interesting concepts that virtual reality allows for is this movie going to waste? Excuse me. Once again, for the... I, I might, again, touch my face at some point in this video. I washed my hands since last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before I go outside next time. Clyde cuts part of Elizabeth the Snake's tail, and we see the the you know glass that you know he he uses the the glass beaker to to heal her. Good visual storytelling instead of just saying that that's what would happen. Intriguing flashback to Parker's family. They legitimately do a good job with the with the flashbacks. Good detail that Sid is slightly surprised by gravity. We already know that gravity is different in VR. We saw him do that ridiculous backflip. I'm not 100% certain how Sid knew that he could regenerate with glass since it was news to Daryl. Clive knew, but Daryl didn't, so it can't have been him who told. And Clive didn't... Well, let's see. Yeah, no, I mean, Clive wouldn't have gone to see Sid and talk to him directly. Yeah, no, I. it just... Because it, the the program was like he he can't hear what they're saying when he's just in the crystal, and he hadn't been put in. Yeah, it's one of those things where the the screenwriter forgot that the character couldn't know something that the screenwriter knew. I appreciate that Parker realizes how the deal could potentially really screw him over. They do a pretty good job of the flashbacks. I mean, as I was watching, I already, you know, I had, I didn't remember, but I had read in reviews that, you know, 
gonna end up finding out that he, you know, killed the the reporters. But watching, it, I was still psyched to see more of them, and that that never failed. That that, yeah. And a nice little detail that you know when Forsyth and Parker are talking, you know, before Madison enters, actually a little after as well. You can see this small like band aid or something on Parker about where the implant was put. You know, I, th I think it might be slightly misplaced, but I appreciate the attempt at continuity at least. I kind of feel like. When the criminal psychologist threatened going public like that, it would be more realistic for them to try to silence her instead of letting her go with Parker. I it, it just they they didn't seem like excuse me people who loved other people manipulating them. I'm not going to talk very much about Child Kelly Kuoko. I think she does a pretty decent acting job in this. You know, I haven't seen her in that much, and I am aware that some people do not think that she does good acting today. I've seen her do good acting, you know. The Symphony of Screams is legitimately a memorable scene. And once he is making music, the, the subtitles for The Hearing Impaired refers to it as a din of screams and electronic music. I guess someone's someone's not a fan of the of the music. Everyone's a critic. And let's see. When I saw Parker jump onto the hood of the police car that Sid was driving. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Thinking about it, I guess he knew that he had plot armor. Like, what made him think that he wouldn't get really badly hurt? Maybe not die, but like, if someone goes flying off the hood of a car when that car is driving fast, you usually get hurt. Like, if he breaks his leg, he's not gonna be able to catch up to Sid. Yeah, just... Like I said in the review, the, you know, smart people making really stupid decisions suddenly. And let's see. And seeing Russell Crowe literally, you know, he grabs glass from the windshield and munches it down. Where else are you going to see that? That's, that's, wow. That's legitimately, yeah. He's evolving into what? And smash cut to Sid strutting to staying alive. Poor Kuleshov must be turning in his grave. The minimal reaction to Sid snapping a guy's neck. And, and the just... And then, you, like, the, the guys only really start reacting once they start feeling threatened by Sid. It's just ridiculous. If you're going to present a society where regular people are that cold-blooded, you have to explain how that happened. And it would be difficult to rewrite the scene. It's Sorry, it would not be difficult to rewrite the scene so that people do react. They did react way more when he shot a robot bartender earlier. I guess it was the sound of the gunshot that bothered them. Maybe as they're screaming out what they're really trying to say is that cost a lot of money you bastard just what is this what am what am i watching did do, was this literally written by several different people who didn't agree and then just stitched together just like the fact that he is so ready to kill like, he, he goes up and he changes the channel on the TV, and then the guy looks at him and says, don't mess with me, and then changes the channel back, and Sid is like, why not? And he snaps the guy's neck. That, by itself, 
Like, hypothetically, if you cut the scene there, that's actually not bad. I, I may be kind of like, because that shows it takes nothing to set him off. He can, he'll kill you just like that. He'll kill you as soon as look at you. But the fact that the other people don't even react, they're filming him. They're filming him, and it's on the TVs. What? Nobody behaves like this, okay? I'm sorry, but, okay, either they, they like, back away or run away, or they want to know more. But they don't just stand there and passively film. You know, maybe they're like, oh, I really hate that guy. He's, he's a total asshole. Thanks for killing him. Or... Wow, I wish I had the balls to kill someone like that. Something. But you don't just stand there. No one no one acts like this. And before you say, oh, it's just a movie, it's not real life. No the rest of the movie suggests that people wouldn't like again, they had way more of a reaction to the bartender. Robot bartender being shot. So when Parker showed up at the dance club, Sid immediately ran away. But then he was, act, you know, actively waiting for him when Parker drove toward him with a shotgun. You know, there he returned fire, but he could have been the club as well. And just, it's not like he's taking cover. He's literally standing on top of the police car, waiting to be shot. And, and Parker just shoots him a bunch of times. Does he even try for headshots? He knows that that's where the thing is, right? Wasn't he told? That the... No one told him, did they? Why? Or maybe I just forgot. But in that case, why doesn't he go for a headshot? Like, it's just... it. In Terminator 2, a lot of, you know... I'm not going to spoil it. In Terminator 2, there are times where they shoot the T-1000 even though they know that shooting him is not going to stop him completely. But they don't necessarily have to stop him completely in that specific situation. They, they just have to slow him down so they can get away from him and then maybe later stop him when they're in a, more, in a better situation. But Parker is trying to stop Sid. In fact, if Sid gets away... He goes back to prison, solitary 17 years. Just, the movie makes no sense. The movie makes no sense the moment you start to think about these things. It's so frustrating. I do stand by the seven. And not just because I'm stubborn, which I am. Seven out of ten rating, sorry. Again, sometimes... I forget to finish a sentence. Kind of like that one. There was actual fighting in the crowd at the MMA match. So is the movie saying that it's impossible for people to watch violence without wanting to commit violence? Maybe they think MMA is a gateway drug and eventually people won't even mind seeing violence in real life even if it's clearly unplanned. I mean, in addition to the movie doing ridiculous equivocation, this is also one of the many cases of Hollywood criticizing violent media whilst being violent media. It's incredibly hypocritical. Clearly, people went to this movie wanting to see violence, and now they're being told that wanting to watch violence makes you a sociopath. Again, if the movie just presented a future society where people were consistently sociopathic, not caring about violence happening to people, but then society wouldn't be able to function normally, and yet it seems to largely do so. You know, maybe what the movie should ha do is have people gradually join Sid, but then obviously that would go against the movie's desire to make him just, you know, be on his own throughout. Just, yeah, but the, just a few quick things from the MMA scene. As others, you know, I've, yeah, just in case you don't read the, the review, since they're, I think it was one of the reviews I found via the IMDb external reviews page. So, you know, I'm not expecting everyone to read it. Someone pointed out that they're doing a cult-like chant. They're saying kapow, like every few seconds. 
and someone pointed out that they don't actually there's there are at least some shots where they don't even stop doing the kapow even though he clearly threw a guy like they can't possibly think that that guy didn't get badly hurt and they, the ones who saw it i'm not saying everybody saw it and they can't possibly have thought that, that was part of the plan right because he was in like in that case aren't they worried it might happen to them because he was a spectator like them and just the yeah let's see and um yeah i i don't know a lot about mma i'm just not really into I'm just, okay, I'm going to try to find a way, Some sometimes people find it offensive when I say, I don't watch stuff like MMA and boxing and wrestling and such, I'm just not, I, I'm not claiming that there isn't a visceral thrill to seeing violence that you know isn't, like, you know, obviously it's different to, if you see a real life violent fight, that's, you know, something you want to stop, but I'm just not, it, it, yeah, I, I don't like watching it when it's a, I only watch it in fiction. Let's, that's, that's basically, yeah. I, I don't think there's something wrong with watching MMA. But I don't know enough about how it works. But apparently, according to people who watch this movie and know MMA, apparently it's completely inaccurate in, in many ways. And it is just... Why do they even buy, like, it's, it's a real thing. Like, why didn't they just make up their own thing? Like, apparently the guy standing down there and with the, with the microphone is one of the real people involved with, so why did they bother getting him and having, I don't know, is the arena, is that how an MMA arena normally looks? Or maybe it was the fighting, I don't know exactly how people knew that that's supposed to be MMA, but... It's supposed to be MMA, apparently, so why just, why not either do it accurately or just make up your own thing? Like, I'm not saying that, like, oh, you know, why does The Running Man not show how those games actually go? Well, those games don't actually exist, so they can just make up their own thing. It only has to make sense, you know, in the world that the film creates, but... Here they're showing a real, like, in, 19, in 1995, apparently there was MMA since, you know, so it's reason. Did they think that in four years MMA would turn into what they have in the, it just, why would you even, like, it's, it's baffling, mind-boggling. And then we have the, the flashback with, with Grimes, and we see, he says, in democracy, a few people have everything, a lot of folks have nothing. That's not democracy, that's capitalism. So the movie is basically saying that if you're against capitalism, you're also against democracy, and you're a terrorist. The movie could so easily have had proper criticism of capitalism by saying that he did try to create change through democratic means, but let's say some corporations put a stop to it, and so he turned to violence. The movie was made after the Berlin Wall fell. The Soviet Union was gone. Why were they still so worried about communism? You know, the the the, the biggest communist ah, uh, what's what is it? Yeah, the the Soviet Union had just been taken out, you know. I mean Terminator 2, which came out in 1991, 4 years prior, was willing to acknowledge that Russia was no longer an enemy of the United States. So it just it's so frustrating, and they didn't have to bring it up. They could have had him say, I don't like Mondays. You know, it didn't have to be a thing. They could have... Uh, just so, so frustrating. And they could have brought up criticisms of capitalism without, you know, coming to the conclusion that capitalism is a bad thing. There are movies that do that. You know, but no, instead, just have him equivocate democracy and capitalism and have him be a violent terrorist. Just, yeah. And again, like, and, and they specify he's killing a lot of people with bombs. If the thing that bothers him is that 
a lot of people don't have anything, then why doesn't he also, you, you know, you don't have to, you, you could make him like morally gray. Maybe he, in a, you know, yes, he kills people, but he also like steals money and gives it to the poor. So there's this thing, you know, making it a little more interesting and complicated. Again, I'm not, if you kill someone, you are in the wrong. You know, you should never, the only reason to ever kill someone is if there is no other way to save someone that, if you kill person A, it had better be because otherwise there's no way to prevent person A from killing person B. That's the only reason to kill someone, period, end of discussion. I'm not saying that he would somehow be a good guy just because he also gave money, but I mean, the way they wrote him like that is because they want to say if you don't like the fact that some people have a lot of money and other people have very little, well, I guess you're, you're Grimes. You're just a sociopath who wants to blow people up. And some people might actually like that. So, you know, the, it's sending the message that you can't have a reasonable discussion about these things. You know, you... you like, imagine, I was not politically active in 1995, but, like, if I had been going around saying, you know, and, and criticizing capitalism, maybe someone would have said, what, so you're like that killer in the movie? You know, it's just, and there's no reason for it. Just have him say that there's, you know, just, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. Just something, you know. I mean, Sid is, oh, actually, no, wait, no. Sid is because humans have a natural drive towards violence, just, which again is so much more interestingly explored in movies like Thesis and Sinister. Excuse me. So Forsyth, for, Forsyth, breaks the tracking computer and I guess they only have one of those like the people making this had no idea what technology even was like I I, I have to wonder if like the the let's say I guess it would be the the writer who came up with that scene like if the first time he was on set and someone turned on a you know st started recording with the started filming with a camera he like you know, ran away screaming, thinking that something was going to blow up. I, I just, why would they only have one machine like that? And there's no way he would get to smash more than one of them. Can we just agree? I, we don't have to agree on everything. There are a lot of different points of view in this world, but can we please agree that once you, like, he picked, did he pick up a chair and throw it in and, like, start shooting? I'm sorry, but if there's more than one computer, they're prevent they're they're he's not getting the rest of the tour you know he's he's going to they're going to politely ask him to leave at the very very least they're not going to just let him smash up the next computers and it doesn't make any sense for their a to only be one computer like that or b i guess maybe they're saying that there's that the specific computer that there's only one specific computer that can read that specific implant, which also makes no sense. Just so Grimes isn't even, you know, he's not limited to being like he used to because they thought it would be boring if he didn't crave a larger audience. So now it's not even commenting on the terrorism thing anymore. So why bring it up in the first place? Grimes didn't have to be written to be political at all. He could have been a random killer as well. It's just. All these things, like, I, I, one second, I'm, I swear I'm going to try to not create too much dead air here, but I just have to make sure that, whoa, okay, now I mean, there, no, it should still be good, yeah, should still be good. It's because it just told me that it's, it set a thing for, like, like, it basically gave a warning of there's, there's, 
you know, I have now reached a relatively low capacity of, like, the, the hard drive. And that's because I've been postponing, excuse me, moving the, the local recording part of the, excuse me, of the video. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll copy, I'll move them to the, the, I have an external hard drive anyway. So I didn't think about the fact, because there's still plenty of space, but I didn't think about the fact that once there was, I guess there's maybe 10% of space left. It's like 10 gigs. There's no way that this recording is gonna go past that but of course it does yeah makes sense but yeah now I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that afterwards and now there's a political discussion about immigration just so the movie can waste another interesting subject I I swear like probably not in the real world but I like to imagine that like Brett Leonard, no, wait, sorry, the, the writer, probably won't be able to, Eric Burnt, Eric Burnt, the writer, like, after this movie came out, like, he would be trying to impress women, and he'd be like, so, this most recent movie, I wasted so many interesting subjects. I bring them up just so the audience will get excited and think that I'll, that they're going to get a, a complex discussion about a topic that has serious ramifications for the world, and then, just like that, it's gone. Just, someone must have been loving, wasting all this potential. It's just, because the thing is, that let's say that in 1996, a movie came out that brought up some of these subjects, and like, actually did something with them, there would be people who said, yeah, but it's not really original, though, because Virtuosity did it. And the fact that Virtuosity did it poorly doesn't necessarily get brought up, or it doesn't... That, that should be the end of the conversation. If you do a bad job exploring a thing, the fact that someone else does a good job exploring it doesn't mean that you should bring up that someone else did... Like, unless you're trying to say... If what you're arguing is just bringing up that subject isn't automatically good, you also have to do a good job with it then bringing up virtuosity. I think I might make this movie, like, from now on, whenever a movie wastes an, at least one important subject, I'm going to start, like, a counter and, like, be like, is it going to be as epic as, as virtuosity gets with that? The increasing viewership, you know, once he turns it into death TV, the increasing viewership happened ridiculously quickly. I mean, I guess it would have to spread by word of mouth, it clearly, it increases almost immediately, almost as if, I don't know, I guess it's scanning everybody in America's brain to see if they would want to watch. This movie makes no sense. Just, are, how could the, how could it increase just like that? Like, people would have to find out that it had changed. Or is it not actually gauging viewers? It's just saying, oh, you know, it's, it's, like, people turned on their TV and just had it on that, just, you know, but now they're actually watching, you know. They, they, they may have had their attention, but now they have their interest. Why would they be spending so much effort trying to kill Parker, who supposedly killed one person? The reason why they didn't send all those SWAT guys after Sid was bad publicity. Because, oh, they let him out. They also let out Parker, and now they're trying to shoot him. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Like, I have to wonder if, like, I've never had a conversation with Eric Burnt. I'm sorry, maybe eventually I will learn your name, because... <laughs> You're getting on my nerves, dude. You are. I'm sorry. I have nothing against you personally, but... You could have done a better job with this. That's all I'm saying. I have to imagine that, like, when he hears other people say that it doesn't make sense, he's, like, he's like existing in an alternate reality where it makes perfect sense, you know, and just the... the because that is interesting. Sometimes you watch a movie and it's like, wow, I hope I never meet the person who directed this because they have very messed up ideas about how the world should work, because, wow.
They love you so much they want you dead, Ed. Yeah, clearly no one could possibly be watching worried that they're going to see him die. I realize that watching doesn't mean that you can somehow stop it. But, I mean, it's the movie saying that when we watch, like, when people watch videos of, like, real-life police brutality, is the movie saying that deep down we like seeing that rather than, you know, we're, we want to know what happened so that we can better, you know, if you don't know what happened, some, sometimes it's unpleasant. I'll admit, I really don't like watching them. I do, I try to avoid watching stuff like that. I really, really can't stand seeing real-life violence. But I'm not under the impression that people who do watch it Obvi the obvious reason to do that is so that you can know what happened so that you can try to figure out how to prevent you what when you watch a bad thing happen that you know is bad I'm not saying every single time but a really good reason for that is to figure out why it happened so that you can prevent it from happening again you know it's just just because they're watching and they're seeing him hold the gun to Ed's head does not mean that they're hoping that he'll be shot. And, you know, Sid goes all like, it's not my fault. I'm not to blame. I would say I want to hear Russell Crowe singing Hellfire but I've listened to a little bit of Russell Crowe singing, and I no, I'm I'm gonna be okay. I'm 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 okay. Why didn't it occur to Sid to pick up some glass and carry it in pockets of his clothes so that he doesn't have to keep finding it to heal? I mean, he's putting his crimes on TV, so of course he knows that sooner or later Parker is going to show up. It's just like. I think the writer is only thinking one scene at a time, and so he doesn't realize that his characters can think more than one scene at a time, because they do these things that don't make sense. Just, yeah. And Parker swings with Sid on the, I, I, I don't know what it's called, I forget what it's called, and, you know, he, he holds on to the thing swinging on, and Sid, you know, flies through the air, and lands, and Sid is like, oh no, glass, my one, not weakness, I don't know, what's the opposite of weakness, power, I, strength, my, my strength, whatever, why, why are you like this movie? Why are you like this? I, I... This is... I'm trying not to get into a ranty review because that's not what I want to do anymore. But this movie is testing me. This is, this is a, this is a test of my constitution. That's what this is. This is... See, the bit here where Sid is healing and Parker goes all close to him would have made a lot more sense instead of Sid crashing onto glass and Parker acting like that isn't going to help Sid. If Sid had glass in his pocket and stuck a hand, you know, let, so this is his, his pocket and he just like slides down there and, and Parker sees him slide down there and sees the healing start. And then he's, you know, but yeah. Why is the scientist gloating that Sid, like, he, he, you know, he's clearly gloating that Sid actually, like, you know, you have the thing of, like, the, the, ah, uh, one second. You know, with Sid dead, now it's going to, you know, how are they going to find Karen? I want to say her name is Karen. Child Kaylee Cuoco. And yeah, I, I, 
I don't know. I, I, I agree with the idea that he's, you know, D Daryl is gay and attracted to Sid. But why on earth is he gloating that Sid is gone? And then, you know, then we see the, the VR thing, which... So I guess he was gloating so that they would listen to him, which makes no sense. Just, yeah. Excuse me. I don't hate the ending. I, it's, uh, I need to be more specific. I don't hate that we have a little bit of VR there at the end. And I'm not saying everybody who didn't like the movie straight up hated that bit. I don't necessarily think that it's handled in the most, like... Basically, it almost looks like they, they, they kind of just suddenly the thing that was happening is happening again. And it just seems kind of like... I guess the way to do it, instead of Sid... Well, let's see. Yeah, yeah, what... Parker wins by ripping the, the crystal out of the back of Sid's head. I think maybe... Yeah, you know, it, it's completely clear that we are in VR after that. That's that's the you know the the alternate reality where where Kesha was a cyberpunk fan. Her her song was "We Are in VR." Wow. Okay, so yes, the ending. They're in VR. I think it would have made more sense if basically the the it had played out linearly instead of like stopping and then going a little bit back and then playing out like if hypothetically yeah if if instead of us seeing him rip sids like if we yeah, i i guess at the end of the day there's no really great way to do yeah i i like to try to rewrite scenes that I think could work better, but thinking about it, I did. I'm not sure you can make, I, I, as, as long as they, they wanted it to have a sort of continual, ah, that's not the word. They wanted to have a quality of seeming to just smoothly move on rather than stop and then us see them be plugged in, you know, and I can appreciate that, but I, I, don't think it was that good of an idea if I'm just I'm really quickly gonna let's say let's see let's say that instead of us seeing him rip out Sid's you know like he let's say that he he grabs for the back of Sid's head and it kind of looks like he's gotten a hold of something. He's like starting to strain and pull. And then it cuts to Madison. And she, yeah, and she maybe, you know, says something like, that's the chip. The chip is back there. And then we see Sid get back up and knock Parker away. And then we get the VR bit. And then a little bit later, yeah, yeah, because it's, there's not that much time passing, you know, then we have the bit where, okay, I would definitely change, but okay, whatever. I would not have Parker fall that far and then somehow survive, but I'll get into why just briefly. What the, the, yeah, so, so Sid does something to him that makes it seem like he's lost. And then instead of us seeing him get up like that, or, yeah, they have a similar thing in the in the way I'm writing the scene. And then we see that he did actually, you know, we we, we get like a brief, the movie has flashbacks already. We get this very brief flashback and we see that he did pull out Sid's chip. And, you know, we, we can surmise, oh, so they went back and went into the VR. So, 
so that there's a smooth transition between the two. Because as it is, it just, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. I guess the idea is, yeah. I'm working, my New Year's resolution is to finish a sentence. I'll, I'll get there eventually. The movie is saying that tricking Sid into, you know, he, if he doesn't realize he's in VR, he'll behave as if he's in reality. And they can use that to trick him. But... I guess the idea is supposed to be that he started, like... Because the chip is written... Rip ma bleh. The chip is ripped out. And then... You know, when, when they plug it back in, then it, it kind of... It, cause, cause it's not a continuous, you know, so does he, did he forget, like, the, 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 because you can do this, you, you, Eric Burnt, I don't know if you have read Philip K. Dick, but I think you would love it. Because Philip K. Dick makes this sort of thing work, where like the the like just the the mem memory thing, you know, if once you if you think that you're in one world and then you actually are in another, you you would have to forget the part that where you where you die in one of the worlds, so that you couldn't possibly be in the you know, and they just but they didn't establish that, so it would have to be. Yeah, it just the movie's a mess. The movie's a mess, and I need to I need to put down the broom and just accept that it's going to keep being a mess, no matter how much the the broom and the the glue stick, which I have for when I glue stuff. No one's gonna get that reference. Yeah. The movie's a mess. Why does Parker survive such a long drop when before electricity was enough to kill someone plugged into VR? I'm not saying it has to be the same rules as certain other movies where, you know, if you believe you're dead, then you're dead. But I just, why, why or failing that, why would it look I guess the reason it looks like he dies is for Sid's benefit. But then how can they be sure that he's not going to notice again before... Yeah, it just... Why are they now trusting Daryl? He was gloating that they weren't going to be able to get the girl in time. Why is everyone in this movie a complete idiot when the movie calls for it? Sid starts manipulating the VR world, so Barnes goes flying. This is interesting. I like it. Legitimately fairly tense here at the end, where Sid is trying to overstimulate Parker to the point where it will fry his brain, like we saw happen to the other guy at the start of the movie. I like it. I, I don't have a glass. Imagine I have a, a glass. Another! And Parker looks down, sees multiple lasers that could trigger the bomb. Where is Catherine Cedar Jones when you need her? This is the only way I'm going to get through the rest of this movie. I just have to think about much better movies. I don't actually, not even, is that actually that good of a movie? Or do people just remember that bit of it and just like, eh. R.I.P. Sean Connery. Uh, 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 I thought of that one too. No, you didn't. You just watched Jurassic Park. Okay, he didn't steal the situation from there, but the the comeback from it. And you know the the we we see that when the the timer reaches zero, it just goes back to the I, I want to say like forty three, and you know once again Sid goes ah ah ah. Oh, great. Sid's stuck in a feedback loop and Fry's an idiot. 
Thank you. It helped end the movie. That's thanks enough in itself. Why does Parker throw the, purple, the crystal off the roof? What if it didn't break? Why wouldn't you just step on it or something? It's not like you needed a dragon. You, you, have, you have ways. There are means. This is... Was part of this script written... As uh, what what are those called again? Like the the thing with the the crap. I forget what they're called, but the thing where like you have to put, you know, ad ad libs or that it's you know the the thing where you you have to put mad libs. I think it's what it's called, because that would explain a lot. And as the credits roll, I realized that the movie's assertion that that people who, you know, that that we all have this this drive towards violence, and that's what creates psychopathic killers, is literally something one of the Manson family members said in court as to why they committed those murders. I'm not going to equivocate like this movie does, but I do think that it goes to show just how surface reading this movie's understanding of why human beings commit violent acts. You know, the, the the Manson family are even, you know, brought up and mentioned several times. The characters even point out, you know, that I, I forget the exact, it, it said something with pigs. I don't remember the exact phrasing. You know, writing that on the walls in blood, that's, you know, like Manson. And, and you know, maybe it could be interesting for the movie to try to take apart that claim instead of just, Repeating something that a serial killer literally said that it, I'm not saying that thinking this is the same as being a member of the Manson family, but I am saying these killers wanted for people to know about these these murders, and this movie helps people know about them. It's it's just it's so poorly thought out. Again, I'm not I don't think that it necessarily leads to a lot of real life bad stuff, but it's just not very well thought out, is what I'm saying. So, yeah, the movie, right, 37, uh, an hour and 37 minutes, not 36. That's clearly the, that's the problem here. And if you stay through the end credits, it is an hour, 41 minutes, and 32 seconds long. And I'm okay, I'm gonna be okay. I'm, I'm, I'm me. I'm not going to be okay, but the movie is not going to haunt me forever. I am certain of that. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken before watching. Excuse me. So, let's see. Yeah, so, you know, Brett Leonard, in 1992, he, you know, 1992 came out The Lawnmower Man, which is as bad, but in some ways more fun, and certainly Lawnmower Man 2 is fun if you're in the right frame of mind for it, and he directed Dark Star, no, 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 oh, it's not a remake of the John Carpenter movie, fine. Proceed. I, I don't care about the... As long as it's not a remake of the John Carpenter movie, make whatever movie that... Yeah, so apparently the only other thing I've seen that was written by Eric Burnt was Romeo Must Die. I, I remember that movie as making more sense than this one. Now, I am not, let's see, oh, and I have watched American Gangster, where you also have Russell Crowe and Denzel Washington going up against each other, which, I don't think I have to say the words that American Gangster is a better movie than Virtuosity. And 
Und ja, yeah, so Louise Fletcher, you know, I saw, yeah, I've, you know, she was on Heroes, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and I, yeah, you know, the, oh yeah, she was in Once Upon a Time. There's a couple of actors in this who were in Once Upon a Time in America. I forget if they shared scenes, but, you know, class reunion. But yeah, you know, I have, of course, watched One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and she is very, very, yeah, Nurse Ratched is absolutely terrifying, and yeah. And I mean, she does, she has this, you know, she has that same kind of cold and controlling kind of thing going on here, and not caring you know, not having a lot of empathy for the people that she's clearly hurting. Now, let's see. And... Yes, so, the... There we go. So, virtuosity is, you know, means, the, the actual definition of the word, before they chose it for this movie, it meant great technical skill or a taste for or interest in vir virtue. Is that meant to be spelled like that? Uh, anyway. I, I guess the idea is that the something about the virtual reality, maybe Sid himself, he's so well crafted that it's an example of virtuosity. Honestly, it's probably because virtuosity kind of sounds like virtual as in virtual reality, but there's yeah. Now, frequently when new technology is being developed, there will be some anxiety and or excitement about what it might be able to do, and sometimes that technology does really change the world. And as such, these pieces of fiction continue to resonate, even if parts of them are disproven or at least hasn't happened yet. We can still get a lot of enjoyment out of movies based on leaving Earth, going into space, even though in reality there haven't been, you know, we haven't gone that far when you look at, you know, in the in the 50s and 60s, boy, did sci-fi writers think that we were just going to go all the way out there and it was going to, like, just, yeah. I suppose I should say at least yet. Maybe in the future we will be able, you know, but space exploration has led to a huge amount of incredible new technology. But then other times the technology really doesn't lead to very much new technology, or at least not stuff that changes our lives. Virtual reality definitely led to a lot of terrible movies that had no idea what virtual reality would actually look like and what it could do. And so we have movies that imagine horrible violence that uses virtual reality like this and the two lawnmower man's men. Sorry, no, lawnmower's man. And I don't currently own copies of the lawn lawn's mower man's men and i'm not currently planning on doing videos on them but yeah the wow i mean the the fascinating thing is they actually some of the time have ideas about you know just like and it, you know yeah technically i mean existence and the matrix or you know but they just I guess what I'll say is they imagined virtual reality as being incredibly convincing where, you know, here, yeah, 
I mean, it really is fascinating that they, like, in virtual reality, someone's gonna create a super serial killer from that, and it's just like, what? How did you get there from, you know, you put on glasses and you can see a... How did you get to super serial killer? That's just like, that's, yeah. And and the and the lawnmower man stuff is hilarious. I suppose. Yeah, I'll just very briefly. Spoilers for Lawnmower Man One. In that virtual reality can be can be used to teach someone who's I, I forget if they give an exact name to it, but you know, Job. I want to say is. A little slow, you know, but virtual reality, he becomes a super genius, and then he can violate the laws of physics, and fun stuff, just like, so because you can plug someone's brain into VR, you can suddenly, like, so the, yes, yeah, so the idea must be like the, the computer, the, like, processing speed, I guess, can put stuff in a human brain, even if the human, like, it, it can, like, speed it up. It's just, I, I, fascinating, the things that they, yeah, anyway, no more spoilers for Long Long Man, unless I warn and raise my finger again. And to anyone who might claim that, you know, Sid calling the show Death TV would mean that no one, you know, only a psychopath would tune in to Death TV. I'm not sure exactly when the show Big Brother came on the air. It might not have been, by the, but, you know, still, pretty sure the people who tuned into that did not actually think that they were, you know, that they would be helping a dictatorial state spy on unwitting citizens. You know, sometimes TV shows are called something that catches the attention, even though it isn't representative. You know, in some countries, the movie Thesis is referred to as snuff, even though it's not itself a snuff film. So just, yeah. So, moving on to YouTube videos about virtuosity. So there's a couple of trailers. Yeah, so the, there's a 2 minute 36 minute, so that, 2 minute 36 second trailer. This movie's melting my brain. In, in a few minutes, it's going to come running out of my ears. 2 minutes 36 seconds. It does a pretty decent job at selling the movie. It does feature the staying alive bit, for better or worse, but I, it's representative. So It shows a lot of action and tension, uses rock music to help sell it, and there's also... You know, there's a, a trailer that's like 1 minute and 11 seconds. I don't really have anything to add to that. And let's see. And there, you know, there's one that looks like it's a minute and 28 seconds, but really it's the one minute, 11 seconds, and then there's 17 seconds of, you know, like text or something. And yeah, so the off the shelf review, they mock the gaudy costumes. And yeah, one of them says, once Sid has a body, it would be better to just rewatch Demolition Man. That's all it's going to be. And you know, one of them says that he, Sid is like a combination of every Joker we've seen. And it would point out how ridiculous it is when he's laying on his back at the ah, what's it called? MMA fight. And they point out how stupid it is that they arrest Barnes, one clearly of Sid who killed the hostage. And it's so cheap that the kid gets kidnapped and put by a bomb. And Yeah, and one of them actually said that Kelly Lynch did such a good acting job for the reaction shot that she that uh, he felt bad for her, but at no point in the movie did he actually feel bad for Barnes, who's grieving his wife, unless, you know, and, and the other one said, well, he's done grieving, though. He's, he's, you know. And, yeah, they point out how stupid it is for Parker to just walk off like it's safe when the guy who heals using glass is surrounded by glass. And 
yeah, so one of them, the, I think these are all, one of them said, I like seeing Denzel Washington beat up, a not, beat up the Nazi comic, seeing Russell Crowe be born in the act. That is legitimately, again, like that's, there's, you, you have a visceral reaction to, I mean, it's, it's messed up that it is basically saying, you know, if, if you don't conform to, if, if it doesn't feel natural to human beings, it must be wrong, but it, it is legitimately effective, you know, it, it, the the way yeah and and again they do a good job you know some of it is a person standing there and some of it is like cg and since it is a cg thing becoming i i thought it was a good choice i, th I thought they did a good job of it and yeah he also liked him walking through the mall in purple suit the music playing when he made music out of people's screams and yeah, and then I think it was the other one who said, it's a chore to get through, and I would have to agree. And, yeah, and he says, I'm constantly being hit in the face by the script. It's cheap and ugly. And I forget which of them, one of them says, that Denzel Washington was the only person giving a good performance. Everyone else is a cartoon character, and yeah. And I rewatched Film Brain's review, the Bad Movie Beatdown review of Lawnmower Man 2, Beyond Cyberspace, or Job's War, and points out the first Long Long Man is technological fear-mongering. He's right that the second movie is garbage, but I'm, I don't think he really appreciates how much fun you can have watching the garbage that it is. You, you have got to be fully aware that it's garbage, but I watched it, I, maybe I was also just the right age for it, but yeah. I think I might have been like a teenager when I watched the first two, and first, sorry, both of the Lawnmower Man movies. There's only two. Jesus Christ! I okay. You know what? If they make a third one, I might watch it because those movies are just bananas. And yeah, I if they make a third one. I'm pretty sure there's not a third one. Anyway, but the, yeah, sorry. When I was, I, I watched both. I think I might have been a teenager at the time. And I forget, I think at the time I might have thought that the first one was actually kind of okay. But I, I'm pretty sure I always knew that the second one was just bad. Just a bad movie, but fun as long as you watch it knowing that it's bad and, and you're like, you're, that's a movie where you're either, either you're going to enjoy how bad it is, or you're just going to always be struggling against how, because it's so stupid. And I feel like that's maybe kind of what the film brain did. And that's the thing. I, I, I'm not going to lie. Before he started doing like projector reviews, I was a little worried that he was just subjecting himself to only bad movies that made him really angry and unhappy. I'm really glad he started doing projector because clearly a lot of those movies he does genuinely enjoy watching and he's you can tell that he's happy to be praising something he's happy to be saying they did a really good job on this this and this you know and just yeah and i i'm afraid i don't remember where i found this link or sorry I found this link on the external reviews page, but I don't remember which of the links, but, you know, it was, it, it was a, a podcast instead of a, a, what's it called, text review, and, okay, it was called Dance or Nano Death, apparently, and, yeah, so, one says it's like Demolition Man, let's see, it was made when every movie had to have an I'm Too Sexy montage, no matter how many times Denzel shoots, Russell Crowe doesn't seem to learn that as long as there's a lot of glass around him, you just heal. And at the end, he just gets uh, fucked up by him a lot. Or, he gets him by just fucking him up a lot. That's right, yeah. And, yeah, and one of them says, you know, it's preceded by a battle of wits, but that really is how he wins. And yeah, and the DVD came with a 2 minute 25 second trailer, and it's almost the exact same trailer as the online one, but it's not quite. There are some differences. Okay, so 
Critic Sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. Okay. Oh boy. Okay, so I, I noted 215 different things that I might want to talk about. So I'm just, I'm not going to read, I'm almost definitely not going to get into every single one of them, but the, let's see. So I hope there's not going to be too much dead air, but it is me reading the thing. So this, this critic chose to not say that it's the worst movie that has been made starring Crow and Washington. No, they say the worst movie that could possibly be made starring Crow and Washington. And I, yeah, I, I they, I'm sorry, but most likely they would make a better movie almost no matter what else. Yeah. And... Yeah, in the end, virtuosity is disconnected and uninvolving. It's an enjoyable ride. Meanwhile, this person only gave two and a half out of five. Yeah. And yeah, so this reviewer gave it a one and a half out of four and said someone should tell someone should tell Hollywood that masculine genre is dead and that its virtual reality counterpart is already wheezing. Disappointing action movie which doesn't ever fully exploit the possibilities of its premise. I don't know if you can also hear, there are, yeah, there's a, there's a celebration taking place nearby. So if you can hear someone laughing or cheering, that's what's going on. I'm not sure what else you would think it was. Uh, I am not a ventriloquist. Virtuosity is 95 minutes of unsubstantial firefights and meandering plot twists. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I am getting dangerously close to changing my 7 out of 10. But at the end of the day, boy, Russell Crowe is entertaining to watch. And for a lot of it, just as you're watching, it is legitimately enjoyable to watch. Yeah. There are some interesting ideas at work here with potential for commentary on news versus entertainment and violence in America, but it remains unexplored. Given Washington's presence and the promise of virtual reality action story, virtuosity, blah, virtuosity has some appeal, provided, of course, the viewers aren't selective. Excuse me. Virtuosity, an example of a struggle that goes on in Hollywood between form, uh, excuse me, and invention. Yeah. Now, let's see. So... Yeah, so this is a Rotten Tomatoes user review. Like The Matrix with the Terminator villain. And... And there's one Rotten Tomatoes user review that says, I'd rather watch Troll 2. Yikes. I have not watched the Troll movies, but... I'm not really that interested in movies that are like 
that badly. I mean, from what I can tell, you know, I'm not certain about the first one. It's been a long time since I watched a review of that. But the second one, it seems like they they had very little. Like for example, the the you know they they have to you know they're supposed to be trolls in the movie, and they have very bad costumes and masks for them. And I'm just not interested in watching something that's quite that poorly. Yeah. But it does sound like it could be fun to watch if you're in the right state of mind for it. Now, let's see. Yeah, I think this is a good point. Really adds nothing to the genre. And this reader also points out that it borrows a lot from, um, you know, yeah, it points out Blade Runner. Yeah, I hope it's not too distracting. I, I can imagine the camera might be picking up the, the sounds of celebrating. It's, it's Christmas. What are you going to do? I am not currently in a position to, like, get to a place where I can film where there's absolutely no one celebrating Christmas very close by. Yeah, so this, yeah, this is a critic who says, it's a by-the-numbers action affair and one that is considerably more mean-spirited and humorless than the norm. Yeah. Washington is wasted here. Kelly Lynch is wooden. Crow has a ball going over the top, but... How much taunting and eyeball popping can a performer do? The usual bad movie sometimes gives a few chuckles, amuses audiences by making them feel superior. But young director Leonard makes a different kind of bomb. Fascinated with technology, Leonard makes cutting-edge techno turkeys with wildly elaborate visuals. And ridiculous plots. Now, let's see. I'm not going to quote all of them, but I will say a lot of people said that Russell Crowe makes a fun villain. And yeah, that brings us to IMDb. So I am just, I, yeah, these are, these are some pretty fun taglines. Hell hath no fury like a composite of 183 serial killers. Meet Sid 6.7. Sid 6.7, the ultimate killing machine. Justice needs a new program. And let's see. So, yeah, this is IMDb trivia. Paramount Pictures considered casting Arnold Schwarzenegger as Parker Barnes, but his hefty price tag quickly put him out of contention. I could definitely see that. This really, is, yeah, it's it's the role, it's it's the kind of role that you see. Excuse me. Someone like Arnie, who, just to, yeah, if in case you have, 
you might not know, but I really love Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think he does an unbelievably good job playing the Terminator. And I think he makes enjoyable, dumb movies, you know, very frequently. And, yeah. I don't love all of his movies, but he's frequently fun to watch. But yeah, for sure I could see how Arnie could be, wow. Not sure there are very many movies where a role that Arnie could have taken goes to Denzel Washington. And Michael Douglas was originally cast as Parker Barnes. Is Michael Douglas... I don't, I'm not sure I remember him being in very many action movies. But I mean, he does have the, he can, he can do the, like, ah, what's the word? Like, he's, he's carrying anger and there's, there's tragedy in his past and such. Yeah, he could, he could have done that aspect of it for sure. And, yeah, I'm just very briefly going to, you know, the IMDb goofs section, it lists it as miscellaneous. I, I feel like it's probably more a factual error, but whatever. Glass is mostly silicone dioxide, or silicon. Silicone is a synthetic polymer which, which contains silicon along with carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, etc. So regenerating body parts with glass alone is just not possible. And... Yeah, I th they were probably just hoping that people didn't realize that, but yeah, yeah, that's that's true. You you cannot, yeah. If you find yourself in a situation where you need carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, stuff like that, and you don't have it, things are not going to work out the same as if you did have them. And. Yeah, I think this, so, someone put this in IMDb Goofs as plot hole, and I think they, they do a really good job of, ah, what's the word, S spelling it out. Parker Barnes is arrested for allegedly shooting and killing Sid's hostage at the train station, and later he's accused of killing the policemen who were taking him back to the station after Sid murders them and frees Barnes. I don't know why he put that in quotes, but whatever. Because he wants to see Barnes die a painful death when the satellite-linked chips explode in his brain. The problem is that both of Parker's alleged crimes are not plausible at all. If he shot the woman, it would be obvious from the pattern of her wounds, since he was firing at Sid from the front as Sid fired at him and shot and killed the hostage from behind her, and he had his gun taken away and was handcuffed by the police before Sid arrived for the murder set murder slash setup. It really like it it boggles the mind. I have just, I have I've I have to think of like what what are some other okay so so baffling mind boggling it's it's stunning. There we go. And yeah according to Wikipedia Washington restructured much of the story and dialogue during filming, entirely removing a romantic subtext between yeah, his character and Dr. Carter, is that him? Madison Carter, I guess, whatever, from the original script. And, yeah. And let's see. Yeah, so that brings us to the the chunk where it's Let's see. I copied in stuff that I found by going to the IMDb reviews from other sites, the external reviews section. And I tried to copy in all the 50, the, the 56 that there were. I ended up with 38. So, you know, the others, dead links, other languages, etc. Languages I do not speak. Now, let's see. 
I am going to try to make Try to make sure that there isn't too much dead air. Let's see. Now. Virtuosity thinks it's offering trenchant media age satire by making Sid a narcissistic camera hound. He can't seem to decide whether he'd rather be a psycho killer or a TV star. But his antics don't lead anywhere. All Virtuosity can summon the imagination for is orgies of conventional gunplay, chase scenes that end in loud falls to the plate press glass windows, he, no one falls through grass in this movie that, that I can recall. And crying children who need to be rescued from bomb-laden booby traps. I mean, that is the thing. The movie would be a lot stronger if you actually had some really clever... Like, at the end of the day, Sid never has a single really, really brilliant scheme, does he? It's it's just fairly rote stuff. I'm once again, I'm not saying the movie sucks because it doesn't live up to, in this case, The Dark Knight. But yeah, I mean, that's a movie where the villain knows what he wants to accomplish and sets out to do so. You know, don't tell me that the the Joker is that much smarter than you know, these 183 serial killers who, you know, you're telling me there's not a single one of them who's equivalent smart, you know, who's, who's roughly as smart as the Joker. Just, it, it would be so much more interesting if the, although I guess, let's see, yeah, so it would, I guess it would have to be something along the lines of if enough people watch the violence, then something bad happens, which I guess is untraceable, which is also not a great movie, but yeah. Let's see. Now. Yes. The part, uh, let's see. Yeah, so Denzel Washington, he does what he's supposed to do and he does it well. But the part was written in such a way that you could have plugged in any fashionable star from the time, and it wouldn't at the time, sorry, and it wouldn't have made any difference. Will Smith, sure. John Travolta, why not? Kurt Russell, bring it on. Hell, even Keanu Reeves. Would it have made one lick of difference? Nope. And Yeah, and here's one who says the movie, only, you know, the movie is almost worth watching for Crow's gleefully over-the-top performance as a sadistic cross between Mickey Knox and Max Headroom. Very well put. That's that's excellent. And. And, uh, yeah, I'm just really quick. Apparently, Sid 6.7 is the product of some of the most evil minds who ever lived. 
Naturally, that includes Hitler and Charles Manson because you don't want to confuse the audience. Let's discount that real that serial killers each tend to have their own pathology, so mix and match doesn't really make much sense. I agree. Let's also ignore the fact that Hitler would probably be disappointed that the best his psyche in a robot body could do is shoot some people. Looks like robot Hitler's brain lacks ambition or has learned to settle. That's a really excellent point, man. I just briefly want to say it could have been really interesting if the brain that like yeah if if it really was like I can't like like ah this okay so I yeah the only way I'm I'm going to have to spoil the yeah so spoilers for 1994's Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is directed by Kenneth Branagh, starring Kenneth Branagh also. In that movie, Frankenstein's creature says, I, you know, I, I can, I, I, I can't quote the exact line, I'm sorry, it's an excellent line, but I have a great capacity for love and a great drive towards violence. And if I cannot satisfy one, I will indulge the other. And I really think that could have been interesting to go into here. That really, he wants something other than the violence. It's just, if... Yeah. No more spoilers for 1994's Frankenstein. I, th I think it would be interesting if there was something other than the the desire for violence in Sid because it, it really is like just you know if you if you take serial killers and combine them in chip it's just gonna make a serial killer because serial killers aren't complex they're just you know I, I mean once again I'm not saying I'm not asking for empathy for Hitler and Charles Manson I'm just saying if we don't understand them, then, you know, we we have a harder time recognizing when there's someone similar. Serial killers, you know, it's not just that, you know, oh, they just run around killing people. And like, you know, they, they have, like, there's, there's always something driving them. And, yeah, it, it would be interesting if the movie was in fact interested in saying you know let's what what it, it would be a really interesting thing if it was actually like yeah hypoth let's let's go with Hitler let's say that Sid you know he he comes yeah he he in in the program itself he can basically you know they they it it works out fine but he comes out into the real world. He no longer has the parameters of the program. And, you know, and before you say, oh, but hi, well, the movie itself does that. And the, and the Sid is programmed to, to kill people in the sushi place, or, well, a hideout in the VR world and kill people there. But the moment that he gets out, he's not like, well, where, you know, I was supposed to kill people in VR world, or, you know, no, he's completely changed. So, yeah, you know, Hitler in a robot body and, like, going around seeing what the world was like and how that might affect him, you know. I'm not saying let's try to feel something for him, but just at least do something interesting. It just, yeah. And... And this, I, yeah. Interviewing the terrorist, the reporter comments, to a surprisingly large number of your supporters, you're a hero. This seems like a relatively decent commentary on the difference between a terrorist and a freedom fighter. The attempt to portray violence as inherently subjective and even justifiable. However, read the line itself. It makes no sense. Of course, a large number of his supporters consider him a hero. They would not be his supporters if they didn't. Yeah, it's 
so badly written. It's it's incredible. The script, not that review. That review is well written. And let's see. Yeah, and the you know the the death TV ratings skyrocket. It just seems like a quiet nod in the direction of social commentary. As does, for example, the use of prisoners as guinea pigs for the virtual reality system. Yeah. I mean, it is a thing. Like, right now, in America, prisoners are used for slave labor. And, I, you know, I'm not saying... I'm not saying all of them deserve our empathy, although some of them are in there for ridiculous reasons, but... Why does the movie bring it up if it's not going to do anything? Like, it's, I don't even know if the movie thinks that it's a good thing or a bad thing or somewhere in between that prisoners are used to as, as guinea pigs because, yeah. And... At one point, Leonard even makes a Staying Alive gang in a film made in 1995. That really, yeah, that is all you need to say. You don't need to, that, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Movies like this, The Net and Lawnmower Man, proved that writers and directors had heard the word computer and then made up magic powers that computers could supposedly do. You can put your brain on hold and suspend disbelief, but only if the movie is good. Most of these are not. It's been a long time since I watched The Net, but some of that movie is hilarious. I don't think it's supposed to be, but it is a laugh riot. You, Yeah. It's very much a... Ah, uh, what's the word? <sighs> no, the word isn't crap. It's right on the tip of my tongue. But it's definitely not crap. I don't know if I should. Anyway, maybe I'll think of it later. There's also quite a bit of gloss to this film, and you might consider the first chunk of virtuosity to be precursor to Crank in blending life and gaming in a feature film. I find the virtual reality boom fascinating because it was built entirely on fiction. All these movies acted like VR was just around the corner, but it still hasn't arrived. Oh, right, and they, yeah, this poor person points out strange days. I remember liking that a lot, but I have to admit, I I remember almost nothing about it by now. I, uh, let's see, if I had to guess 20 years ago, I think, was when I watched it, so, yeah. And let's see. I'm just very briefly going to... This, there, one, one of these reviewers, I'm not calling them stupid, I just, they seem to think that Barnes is serving the 17 years for the clearly accidental murder of his wife and daughter while attacking the madman who kidnapped him. I mean... It's the, it's the two news people. That's why he's in jail. I don't think he got put in jail for triggering the terrorist's bomb. I don't know. Maybe the movie could do a better job explaining it. I'm not here to make fun of people who write reviews. I'm here to make fun of the movie. Now, let's see.
cave. We're on 122 of the 215 ones I skipped through, so we're getting there. Okay, let's see. <laughs> yeah, so this says, you know, Madison Carter was the victim of massive rewrites. The extent of her purpose is to explain parts of Sid's 6.7 psyche and have a child that the villain can kidnap and place in danger for the climax finale. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to read some of this. Despite its numerous deficiencies, Virtuosity gets a few things right about the near future, mainly the rise of MMA. During a televised sporting event, six, six, Sid 6.7 commits murder in front of a larger audience, simultaneously appeasing his, blood, his bloodlust and narcissism. Amazingly, this is set during a UFC fight. Had anyone actually seen the film, perhaps UFC wouldn't be so popular today. The movie presents the fighting as this bizarre ritual where people chant and pump their fists while yelling kapow. When a murderous psychopath throws someone off the mezzanine, they cheer louder, their chants of kapow continuing unimpeded. Sure, someone just got murdered, but the show must go on. Kapow. Very well put. See, this is why we invented the written word. So someone could write something that spot on. That's just, yeah. Let's see. Maybe there was a really interesting draft of the screenplay that got lost in the ether when someone picked up the phone mid-email. That would make the most sense. This is a film that looks at the future with the speed and wonder of a dial-up modem. Very nicely done. And let's see. Yeah, just real quick, I'm just going to... There are many things I don't understand about the sci-fi world and story of virtuosity. Oh yeah, and he points out that at the start it looks like Denzel is in a Captain Panaka cosplay outfit. Yeah, really. And everyone is in a suit carrying a briefcase like they're in the Matrix. And... Yeah, and this reader points out the, let's see, you know, like, let's see, yeah, yeah, you know, the, the, uh, let's see, catching a made-up serial killer in a game couldn't have much application to catching an actual one that exists. And also the training seems just seems to be about chasing him through the city, so why does it matter if he's the ultimate combination of real-life cannibals, necrophiles, rapists, and genocidal dictators? Is that any different from a guy that's just programmed to run and take hostages? And that's, yeah, and, and as he points out, why did they create Sid 6.7? Why do they, yeah. And let's see. All these people being killed in a cheesy rave-inspired nightclub and with Tracy Lords as the DJ really made me want to turn it off and watch Blade instead. There's a movie with a 90s dance music scene, period, instead of funny. And then, yeah, he, you know, he criticizes Sid and then he says, Mark my words, this Russell Crowe will never amount to anything. That's very funny.
and yeah, speaking of Sid, he hijacks a TV forum on immigration, which is predicted to be widely watched. Parenthesis, question mark, parenthesis end. And yeah, and he points out the, the cheesy skull and bones logo for Death TV. And yeah, and he points out, you know, the the he cut yeah, you know, Parker cuts the phone lines, which makes the viewers disappear. I don't really get it. They act like it's TV, and he calls it TV, but I guess it's supposed to be some kind of web thing? Yeah, the movie has no idea what the, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and I, th this is a really good point. This is from the... Yeah, this is another reviewer talking about the MMA. I think they're saying Kapow. And then he says... You know, the, the fighting, yeah, it also serves to make the Parker chasing Sid action even more confusing because they're fighting through the crowd, Sid is firing a gun, throwing people over ledges, and it seems to change from shot to shot whether everyone in the crowd is in a panic or whether nobody notices any of this. And the announcer keeps telling everyone to remain calm while the crowd continues their chant unencumbered. It it really that's that's so it's so true. It really from shot to shot, like panic or kapow. Why? How? What? Where? When? And wow. As an action movie, it's arguably a little more effective. It seems like a bigger budget, and it does have one really badass flashback scene where Parker gets a limb blown off in an explosion but still comes after Grimes like a one-armed Terminator. And This is really good. Washington and Crow reunited in 2007 for Ridley Scott's American Gangster, a way better movie, though with less virtual reality. That's that's a really good. Oh, that, that yeah, that's right. That's that's what that's one of the things Vern uh, Outlaw Vern wrote about the movie. Yeah. Let's see. And Yeah, I'm sorry. This is a little, this is a little funny, so I'll read it even if I don't. I don't agree with everything he says, but anybody who likes this movie is a damn dirty liar. This is a stunningly terrible movie. So is Johnny Moronic. Totally clever in taking this joke to the bank, lol, for that matter. I know Babe and Die Hard with Vengeance came out in 1995. Sorry, came out, but 1995 has to be the worst year for summer movies. I'm still so fucking pissed that I paid for all these shitty 1995 summer movies. Also, their idea of UFC is so dumb. At no point in UFC history was there ever a battle royale like they show here. Just so dumb and embarrassing. And somebody actually, you know, that sorry, that was a comment to, you know, and then someone further down wrote, I like this movie. I like this movie. I'm a damn dirty liar or something like that. And let's see. I watched it again a couple of years ago with a buddy with the buddy and we just had a laugh fest with it our main takeaway denzel washington is a man who looks like he enjoys a nice pair of sweats he's in a sweatsuit for like the entire second half of the movie it's true what what yeah and yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just really briefly going to read it out because this is also very funny. And I suppose... I guess that's not... No, to be fair, that is not a spoiler. That is actually just the plot. Disclosure, the final chapter in Michael Douglas's 
God, it's so annoying how these beautiful women always trying to fuck me cycle. Also has some, and I recall they're even more out of place there. It's based on a Michael Crichton book, though, so I suppose he needed to throw some kind of scientific type research in there to remind people why they read him. It certainly wasn't for his prose or what he had to say about life in these uncertain times, trademarked. Yeah, that's that's really well put. I, I hadn't really thought of it, but Michael Douglas his Michael Douglas's cycle of yeah, that's that's really well put. That's what the fuck was that? Seriously. Just yeah. Let's see. And Okay, almost done. An additional feature is that GTA look, feel, and vibe, especially in the opening scenes. So if you like games like GTA, St. Row, and Sleeping Dogs, there's an extra reason to check out this movie. Enjoy. Now, let's see. There's more broken glass in this film than another 48 Hours, the previous broken glass champion. Now, let's see. Right, and that brings us to the IMDb user review. And I think I copied in all of those. Let's see. I, yes, yeah. I, yeah, I copied in all 95 reviews and it made 53 pages. And I read them all. Sometimes I question my choices when it comes to these. Nah, they're, they're good reviews. I'm just playing. You can't help but like Crow's gleeful portrayal of a schizophrenic nanobot serial killer in this ridiculous film. And with futuristic fascists, pearly programmers, and a bucket loads of virtual reality cyber nonsense, this should really be a winner in the style of Demolition Man or the Robocop series. But where other films in the genre have used such tools and, as wit and plot to keep the more intelligent of the viewers amused, this film, um, Hasn't. Very well put. And let's see. Yeah, so The movie carries some solid entertainment in the near mindless tradition of loud, stupid Hollywood science fiction movies of the 90s. It's like John Woo Light. It's like Crow's imitation of a Rutger Hauer performance, which is a sight to see on its own. It's true. That's a very good comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Holy. He watched. He watched Blade Runner. He's like, I guess that's it. I'll I'll do that and go a bit further. Like he goes to eleven, but that's there's a lot of yeah. There's a lot of of. Uh, ah, I can't believe I'm blanking on. Yeah, but, you know. Yeah, his character in Blade Runner, Rutger Hauer's. Denzel is at his most humorless and looks silly in a leather cop outfit. He looks like he's going to a Halloween party thrown by Ian McKellen. Yeah, yeah, he does. Which... Hypothetically, if, you know, once Russell Crowe gets the vaccine, he can, because Ian McKellen has been 
vaccinated now. And I quite enjoyed, I want to say it was the, ah, crap. You know, I'm just going to say, I, I don't remember what the show was called, but the Stephen Colbert's show, I think, was the one that, you know, did the, the you shall not pass bit with you shall not infect instead. If you haven't watched it already, look it up. It's really funny. If, if you like that scene from the movie, I, I guess if you don't care about this scene, you might not. And let's see. And that is almost it. Crow has a mouthful of scenery in every frame he's in, and he appears to be challenging, cha sorry, channeling every comic book villain portrayed before 1995. There are elements of the Joker, Simon Phoenix, and even Carl from Die Hard in his persona. And although he's hamming it up to major bacon levels, he's a joy to watch. Yeah, and then he goes on to point out Denzel plays it deadly serious. Yeah, it is a kind of, yeah. Let's see. Almost done. Right. Um, some people have compared this to Deja Vu, since that also has, you know, the, the this thing where you can see something that isn't completely, yeah, I don't know. People have compared the two. I'm afraid I can't really say, you know, how I feel, you know, I remember Deja Vu as being a lot better, but somewhat ironically, or perhaps just appropriately, Maybe it's just coincidence. I don't remember the movie Deja Vu. I, I know I've watched it. I'm certain of that, but I do not remember it. Now, let's see. Take Blade Runner for the Who Am I philosophy part of the movie. Add some Terminator 2 for the let's chase and shoot a self-healing, shape-shifting, pretend person bit. A smattering of Robocop for the vision of the future. With the self-identity element too, and a tiny bit of Total Recall for the is this real part. That was all of them, and I have been going on for over three and a half hours, so I think we're all ready for this to, yeah, I I don't think I have anything left to say about this movie, and yeah, but I'm glad I made the video because, boy, is there a lot to unpack here, and yeah, it's like it's like a Christmas gift. There's a lot to unpack. I should probably stop the video before I come up with an even worse joke. So let me let me just briefly let's see, was there anything at all left that I wanted to comment on? Um I don't think so. Yeah, so the, let's see. Yeah, 
that is in fact everything so I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording and I will catch you next time